Okay. Tobias, você está me ouvindo? Oi, bom Olá. dia. Oi, Débora. Tudo bom? É a Patrícia, tudo bom? É a Patrícia, como vai? Tudo bem? É, a gente vai aguardar uns minutinhos, porque o pessoal está lá no hotel tendo que fazer o check-out. Ah, então, tá bom. Tá mais alguns minutinhos, acho uns 10 minutos, tá bom? Ah, você que vai liderar a sessão hoje. É, eu que vou passar um... Ah, que ótimo. Ah bastão aqui o microfone para mim. Tá bom, perfeito. Tá bom. Então, acho que tá, eu, eu aguardo, ok? Tá Tô aguardando, tem problema. So, just to tell everyone, I think we are waiting 10 minutes because people are doing the checkout at the hotels. Patrícia? Alô? Oi, tá me ouvindo? Oi, tô ouvindo. Patrícia, é 50 mais 10, né? 50 Só mais pra... 10. Tá bom. 50, 45, 50 de apresentação e aí... Tá ótimo. Pergunta. Tá, bom. tá ótimo. Tá, obrigado. Imagina.
Oi. Hi, Tobias. Oi. Oi. So maybe we are going to start. The the room is getting full, so I think we can start our section. It's okay for you? Yes, yes, I'm ready. Okay. So welcome back everyone to this last day of this uh, nice workshop. So today uh, for the first talk, we are going to have Tobias Frederico from the Instituto Tecnológico de Aeronáutica here in Brazil. And he's going to talk for us about uh, a few bosons, limited cycles and discrete scale of symmetry in integer and non-integer dimensions. So thank you very much, Tobias, to be with us uh, today. And uh, you can start whenever you want. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Patricia, for the introduction. First, I would like to, to thank uh, both uh, Arnaldo and Alex for the kind invitation and the possibility to talk online to present the work we have been doing with many collaborators in Brazil, essentially. And uh, what is the context of what I'm, I'm going to talk? Okay, technical problems. Okay, what's the context? Is essentially, I will discuss Atomic physics, cold atoms, could be applied to cold chemistry and also uh, to halo nuclei because this will be, uh, I will talk about weakly bound uh, systems, essentially so very large compared to the range of the potentials. And uh, everything I will talk about is thinking on low energies and therefore long wavelengths. So now, first, I would like to introduce the, the helium-4 dimer. Here is the wave function that is actually what was measured, the uh, density distribution as a function of the radio, radius uh, in angstrom's units. And then the binding energy of the dimer of helium-4 is very small. No, it's uh, 150 nano electron volts. And it has a very large tail. And this is small bump here is just the Van der Waals potential. So uh, the wave function is stand far away of the potential. Essentially, it is uh, very universal because it's the eigenstate of the three uh, Hamiltonian. We can go on. This was already uh, experimental information that was taken from the diffraction of, of uh, uh, helium-4 and trimer, trimer beams, dimer beams, and the explosion, laser explosion, that you can have the information on the momentum distribution and from that, you can have the information on the, on the uh, uh, probability density, essentially. And here is the, the, what you get from the ground state, you see in blue. And this is the distance of the helium, helium pair. So this is the trimer, helium trimer. And the distance is pretty large, you see, it is of the order of 15, Angstroms, the average does distance that you have between the, the helium four uh, atoms. And uh, for the excited state, is very large. Now it's 7,500, you can see here. So, therefore, what uh, reminding that the uh, Van der Waals uh, pot or Leonard Jones potential, some potential that you use to describe this. Uh, this uh, primer and dimer. So the range is of the order of the Van der Waals length. That is pretty small. So this is, in that sense, we can think that the wave functions extend uh, beyond, much beyond the potential range. 
Okay, so this is just a list of, uh, of, of uh, atoms and their van der Waals radius. And we see that uh, they are always of the order of a couple of angstroms. No, this is uh, uh, the van der Waals land in units of 10 minus two angstroms. So we have many, many atoms that they uh, interact. I mean, these are the neutral atoms uh, with this uh, van der Waals potential. That is indeed, if we think, uh, I mean, on the uh, molecule that we are going to discuss, this range is pretty small. And uh, we can think, I mean, uh, even uh, these uh, uh, atoms can be trapped in atomic uh, traps and you can manipulate the, the, the scattering lengths no, or the dimer energy if you want as well uh, in, in, uh, with uh, patch bar resonances. And these are, I mean, uh, very large scattering lengths. So you can think now if you, that your scattering length is very large compared to, to the uh, Van der Waals length, for example. Uh, you, we have experiments uh, done with cesium trimer, cesium-2, lithium-6, no? for negative scattering lengths, for positive scattering lengths. And also, there are, uh, besides the helium trimer, there are other molecules, like you see the dimer of helium-2, lithium, uh, helium, helium, the dimer of helium-4, so on and so on, that are indeed uh, weakly bound, no? And um, this could, uh, one could think uh, about if you do reactions with those molecules, this, uh, as you have very small binding energy, remember this is a hundred uh, nano, uh, uh, it's very small, the dimer energy here. And uh, so you have to make these reactions uh, to have a very uh, low temperature. So this defines an ultra cold uh, chemistry. Okay, now going to the nuclei, where you can think about this uh, weakly bound system is close to the drip line, neutron drip line. We have many nuclei, for example, Bohomian systems, and also uh, you could have non Bohomian system like carbon 20. So the neutrons here, two of the neutrons, for example, are weakly bound. No? Are, uh, in the, of course, we have to think now on the nuclear scale. No? So this is a, a fraction of MeV that they are uh, the separation energy. So these nuclei, this halo of neutrons are pretty large. So, so the idea uh, here is just one scheme for lithium-11, that is the most famous boronium. So you have a core of lithium-9, that the size is about three fermis, and the halo of the neutrons at a distance of six fermis from, from that. So this is really a huge halo. The same uh, you can find in carbon-22, for example. So, and then uh, how do we think of a template of this uh, to understand the physics of these uh, uh, weakly bound systems or very large systems, and how we go from three to the two dimensions as well. So the template we I want to discuss is just that as the, as the as the states are very large, much larger than the range, range of the interaction. Essentially, almost everywhere, the wave function is an eigenstate of the free Hamiltonian. No? And therefore, in that sense, universal. But you need uh, some boundary condition to fix it. No? Uh, and this, of course, will, will in, 
uh, you imply the necessity to fix some scale. For example, the binding energy that gives the tail. So what we notice from this equation is that in, uh, there is a scale invariant if the energy is zero. No? Uh, if we change the momentum, essentially nothing happens. No? If we think about uh, the energy equals zero. But then uh, the physics should be dominated, of course, besides some scales, the symmetry that you have fermion bosons, angular momentum, and of course, mass ratio. So essentially, what I'm saying about these uh, uh, weakly bound systems is that they are very large. And therefore, we should expect a lot of model independence. So you change the potential as long as you kept fixed some, uh, let us say, low energy information about your system what you, sh you get should be essentially the same. And of course, the limiting case that I'm going to discuss a lot is a contact interaction. No? Um, but then, of course, there is the question, okay, you are talking about the information you need to put or physical scale to define the system, how many? No? And uh, what happens when we go from 3D to 2D, when we squeeze the system? Okay, just a very naive uh, view of what's going on, for example, in a three-body system. We can imagine that two of the bodies interact, then there is a scattered wave, that this scattered wave will come to the third particle, and so on. So essentially, in the first, uh, if you think a first view of that, what matters is the asymptotic information that is in this scattered wave. And this essentially will, give, will be uh, dominated by low energy S wave information, if we are you know, at very low energies. You know? And of course, uh, in three dimensions, we can think in the scattering length. In two dimensions, I will think about the dimer energy no? that fixes that. But do we need more information than that? Okay, so let us discuss this a little bit more in detail. I will look to two and three particles in three dimensions. So, okay, so what fixes that scattered wave is the scattering amplitude? that is defined through the uh, effective range expansion of K cod delta. We have the scattering line, the effective range, and the situations we are thinking is that the scattering line is much larger than the range or the effective range of the interaction. Just now to remind, if the scattering length is positive, for short range interaction, short range interaction. We have a bound state pole. If it is negative, we have a virtual state that appears in the second Riemann sheet. Okay? So the helium helium dimer is bound, so 150 nano electron volts, scattering length huge, 90 angstroms. Uh, also with Feshbach resonance in cold atoms we have a very large scattering length, much larger than the van der Waals length. In nuclear physics, we have the neutron-neutron virtual state. You see, this is a large energy from the point of view of uh, atomic physics. But on the nuclear physics level, you know, the neutron-neutron virtual state energy or the singlet state uh, is very small. It's 140 kilo electron volts. And in the nuclear uh, scale, the scattering length, neutron neutron scattering length, is se minus 17 fermions. Remember that the nuclear force, the range is about one, one fermi. No? Of course, for halo nuclear, this is also happens. Okay, so now what is interesting in three dimension for? For, for three bosons. That is the FMOV effect. You have heard a lot, but what is important here for us is that 
The FEM of effect that was discovered in 70 in the context of nuclear physics is what? When the scattering length, this is essentially the inverse of the scattering length. So this is the region where you have a bound dimer or a weakly bound dimer. And here you, you have the virtual state, the negative scattering length. So when the scattering length goes to infinity, you have a, an infinite number of levels ge geometrically separated. And in the case of three identical bosons, you have uh, the ratio between two of these energies is about uh, 515. So it's a huge uh, distance between. But what you see here is a discrete symmetry. No, You see the form when you move the scattering line, this form is essentially identical to that. And then they are just phase scale. And here, the Efimov state, when you move the scattering length, it just comes. This is when you uh, increase the modulus of the scattering length. It just comes from the dimer threshold. And then here is when the scattering length is infinite. And when you still continue decreasing the modulus of the scattering lines in the region of negative scattering line, the, the FMOV uh, trimer disappears in the continuum. And it creates a continuum resonance. You know? And this is what allowed essentially to observe it in cold atomic gases. So when, when, you, when you move the scattering length with a fetch by resonance, and uh, the trimer hits the continuum threshold, your recombination, three, three atom recombination, becomes resonant because you have just you know, uh, the bound state nearby. And doing to this uh, recombination, of course, atoms are lost, and then uh, this could be observed, including Later, this was observed for the first time in the paper by, by Kramer et al. for three, for three cesium atoms. And uh, was uh, observed also in uh, other systems. No? But essentially, what we have, a continuous scale invariance, was breaking to a discrete one we see here. How do we think that? So a very simple way to think about is using the potential one over R squared. If, I, if the energy is zero, uh, we, we clearly see that uh, I can change R by some uh, constant. I can multiply by a constant. And the equation, you know, the, the Schrodinger equation doesn't change. And this, of course, happens when the, the energy is very small compared to an over R square, for example. This in units H bar equal mass equal one. And then when this happens, the continuous scale symmetry is breaking, is, is broken to a discrete one. When this happens, you need to introduce a new scale. And as together with that, we also have log periodicity. And this factor here that comes with the strength with this of the one over R squared potential is essentially what gives you the geometric ratio between the bound states. You know? And this essentially is the fall to the center that you found in Landau book of quantum mechanics. And uh, this fall to the center was the Thomas collapse that was known since 1935 and also is the source of the Efimov effect. So now we need, in this case, in three dimensions, one more scale to fix. The scattering length is not enough. So now how this was seen, I uh, just flashed this slide. I mean, these equations to solve the trimer problem 
was long ago proposed by Skolnikov and Termatiriosa in 1956. And this integral equation, essentially, if you take E2 equals zero, E equals zero, or you go to very large momentum or to the center or to very small distances, it has scale invariance. So th that you can transform in this way the momentum. And so uh, you have uh, still the same solution. And therefore, you should have an homogeneous form. What happens is this integral equation, the kernel is strong enough to, to allow that this exponent has an imaginary part. When it has an imaginary part, this was indeed uh, discovered by Danilov, then you go to the log periodic solutions of FMOV, and this is the famous FMOV fact. Indeed, the infinite uh, number of geome uh, geometrically separated states was discussed, was found by Milos and Feider, but they thought at that time about the Thomas collapse. So Efimov in 70 noticed that, okay, instead of R0 to zero, we make the scattering line to infinity. And then we have this uh, infinitely many bound states. But the idea is that what matters is the ratio between the modules of the scattering line and the range. This should go to infinity. If the range goes to zero, Thomas collapse. If the scattering length is very large, FMOV effect. Okay, so this is just the trajectory of the FMOV states. So this was discussed long ago by our colleagues, Adikari and uh, Tomio. Then when you move the dimer energy or the positive scattering line, the, the FMOV state just came, uh, goes to the second energy sheet and becomes uh, a three-body virtual state. So if you increase the dimer energy or decrease the, the, the modules of the scattering line. And here is the same, it goes to a, continuum resonance when the scattering length is negative. No? Okay, this is just to show you, I mean, this is the original uh, data from Kamer on the recombination length. And we see that the position of the, of the recombination resonance, three-body recombination moves to smaller, Mod or scattering lengths uh, with smaller modulus, and this when you increase the temperature. So this is exactly uh, this movement here. So when you increase the temperature, it's like you increase the energy. So your your resonance is going deep and deep. No? And this is exactly the kind of uh, the way it changes. Okay. Okay, so now uh, this geometric, uh, I mean, these FMOV states, I mean, because you have essentially two scales, the dimer energy or the scattering length, no? The dimer uh, bound or virtual energy and, uh, and or the scattering length and uh, uh, one trimer energy, you need one scale. So what happens if you write down the energy of one excited state in terms of the other one, uh, writing down in, uh, dimensionless quantity, like the trimer energy, excited trimer energy minus the dimer energy divided by the, the trimer energy or the state that is immediately below it. So you have a function. So we say a scaling function, but indeed, is a limit cycle. So you can do this state as a function of this state, this state as a function of this state and so on. You have only one line. And here in red is just the, the data for the helium trimer uh, ground and excited state. And these are several other calculations. So this is model independence. 
that is governing that because essentially matters two scales. Okay, uh, when we go to mass imbalanced systems, so that factor, the, this is the square root of the ratios of the tri of two successive trimer energies. So uh, it here is the uh, 515. So when you go to heavy, heavy light system, it decreases, and this is much more easy. No, the geometric ratio decreases, and therefore is much more easy to observe uh, continuous. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the different resonances as you move, uh, recombination resonances as you move uh, the scattering length. So people have indeed observed this in heavy, heavy light systems. Okay, so this is just to give you an idea. This, so this is a, a plot that gives you the thresholds for the, to, for the existence of an excited trimer on the top of a given trimer in the limit of a zero range interaction. And this is uh, the case for three identical bosons. So in this axis, you have the binding energy of the system alpha beta and here is the trimer energy one trimer energy i say zero so is the state is one state i'm looking to the next state and this is the alpha alpha so we are in the alpha alpha beta system so this is where people have measured the trimer of helium four but we see that other trimers like the helium helium four uh, uh, two lithium seven molecule may have because it's inside uh, this boundary here can have an excited FMOS state and this is the FMOS point. No, so the, how this curve is universal. Of course, when you put a range, it will be it will move a little bit. No, when you, for example, if you put the effective range. And here is just one study that we did recently uh, with Lucas Madeira. And uh, what happens to these universal functions when we introduce the, the range of the interaction? So this is the way uh, we parameterize the two-body amplitude. So we just expand in lower order. So this is the effective range. And then we compute the zero range equation with these corrections. And what we found, so this is a function that we can write essentially in terms of these two uh, dimensionless quantities, that is the squattering length times the square root of the energy and the effective range times the square root of the energy. So you can do for any state in this, Quantum Monte Carlo calculation, we look at to the ground state. But look, uh, using the zero range equations or the generalization of it, having the range correction, we can have the limit cycle. So these are the dotted lines. And then with the quantum Monte Carlo calculation, we use the Gaussian two body force and three body forces. And then we see that is really universal. So these are different range. And essentially, we have, uh, I mean, the reproduction, even with the ground state that is quite large, we selected the large ground state in comparison with the range of the interaction. We really see, I mean, even working with the ground state, the limit cycle. Okay, so now, what happens when we go to 2D? So in 2D, this, the scattering amplitude, this was long ago discussed by Adhikari and collaborators. We have the cot, cot delta has uh, uh, some scattering length. This is a dimensionless quantity. And then you have the expansion with log of E and uh, many terms. We can parameterize this as something similar 
to, uh, let us say, to give an idea of the range by this A bar. We introduced this in this old paper that is just the combination of the dimer energy and this uh, quantity A2. So now when we go, of course, we have many terms. When we go to the zero range limit, so this guy disappears and also all the other terms. We just remain this term here, no? So only one scale remains. And what happens in 2D? Efimov effect disappears. So this was discussed uh, quite long ago by Bruch, Bruch and Tijon. So there is no Efimov effect. So the only scale that remains in the zero range limit is the dimer energy. And the trimer, S wave trimer, has only two bound state that are with energy proportionals to A2. And this, I mean, if you change now, if you put the range, so this is the Chon limit. So this is the ground state. If you change this A bar that give you an idea of the range, of course, is a dimensionless quantity. And then you see that you have, I mean, a very universal line that we, at that point, we look at with separable potentials with different uh, powers. And this is really universal. Now you say, but uh, what happens if we start to, make mass imbalanced systems. When we go to too heavy and one line, we start to have many bound state, but never the FMOV effect, never. So this we discussed with Bellotti and Marcelo, I mean, and uh, quite long ago. And this is essentially the region where we have three identical particles that we have only two body states that was the ones discovered by Bruch and Tijon. Okay, so now what we do? Now you want to squeeze, huh? but before doing that, let us remind what we have. In three dimensions, three particles, we have the Thomas and the Efimov effect that are essentially the same effect, no? And what we need of information, one typical three-body scale plus two-body low energy quantities, the scattering length, effective range. When we go to two dimensions, there is no Thomas Efimov effects, no collapse, and there is just the scaling, the dominance of the, of the for example, of the scaling of the quantities with the two-body energies with corrections, but still universal. Okay, so we have now three and two. And what about in the middle? Okay, so in principle, we could think, okay, we can squeeze the system, thinking about we have the atoms in a trap, and then we make an asymmetric trap, and then we squeeze in one direction. Okay. So there are uh, other ways of going, I mean, let us say mathematical tools that will go back to this harmonic oscillator idea. So that is the idea of no integer dimension. Then you can manipulate from three to two. This was indeed uh, discussed in this paper by Nielsen and collaborator quite a, a time ago. You can compactify one, one dimension, then you can go to three, to two, even to one. No? And we can, of course, play with uh, no integer dimensions and look to situations of, uh, I mean, different uh, 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 mass imbalanced systems and so on. Okay. So essentially, these no integer dimensions, when we look to the momentum space equations, this is essentially like dimensional regularization, what we do. And uh, other people have also explored uh, these, these ideas. Okay, so first, dimensional reduction by compactification. So here there is, I mean, a rough, 
uh, diagram with x, y, and z. And what means compactification? I take the z axis and bend and make a circle. If the radius of the circle is infinite, we have, uh, I mean, just the line, just the z axis. But if the radius if, is finite, and if I introduce periodic boundary conditions, I can start to squeeze. Why? Because if the radius is pretty small, I will go to two dimensions. And uh, the compactification will make the kinetic energy be so high that only it will survive the first, the, the lowest mode, that is n equals zero. The other modes will be banned because the kinetic energy will go to infinity. So this is one way to reduce, of course. You have to say, but how I, I relate these compactification ratios with something more concrete? Okay, we are going to, to discuss that. But first, we just play the game of compactifying. So this is just the two-body amplitude, the inverse of the two-body scattering amplitude with one dimension compactifying. And you can see here, if Rz goes to zero, so this is just uh, goes disappear because if n is finite, this will uh, simply drop this term. So when Rz goes to zero, only the, the mode n equals zero survives. And indeed, you can compute this analytically. And this expression is just the two body scattering amplitude. And when you go from Rz uh, zero or close to zero to three, we recover exactly the, uh, the, the two body S wave uh, scattering amplitude. Remember the log and here is just the standard one. This is for negative energies, no? So I'm not uh, introducing the IK that you should have. This is for negative energies. So we are able with this simple formula to, to go from uh, two or to three or three to two. Okay, so now how do we relate uh, this uh, to the harmonic oscillator? What we did was that, okay, we can compute the how the two body energy, binding energy change with the radius, I mean, is again a simple, this is analytic form. And we can put, uh, I mean, a very short range potential in an harmonic trap, and then uh, see how the uh, dimer energy moves. So when we make this kind of mapping, we see that we can map essentially this formula to uh, a result that comes, or we can parameterize the, the dimer energy in a uh, trap in one of the dimensions with a short range potential. In this way, we can uh, relate the, the compactification radius to the oscillator length. So you can compare this essentially these two formulas. And what we did, you know, so this is in this paper by John Sandoval, was a student of Marcelo Yamashita. You know? And then what we did, this is 3D, and this is just the harmonic oscillator length that of course corresponds to some compactification radius. And then in three dimension, we can have many states no, these are the FMOB states. You see, this is log scale. They are geometrically separated. So when we move, and this is the uh, uh, scattering length in uh, uh, three dimensions. So here, in this direction, the scattering length is very large compared to the, to the harmonic oscillator length. Okay, so we are in the limit of FMOV limit here. You see the geometric ratios. So this is for 
uh, a kind of system uh, that will correspond to uh, two cesiums and one lithium. And then you see when we move, when we squeeze the system, the FMOB states, they, they go to the threshold and they disappear in the threshold. In this case, we have a, a bound dimer. And uh, then goes to the, the, you see here in this side, we have uh, three states. So these states are the ones that you found uh, for this uh, mass ratio in two dimensions. So, so this is the way the FMOB states disappear. This is one way to see. And we expect that when you squeeze the trap, you eventually are going, if you are able to measure the trimer energy, for example, by resonant association, you should see this kind of effect. And now the other, the other trick to, was to use a non-integral dimension. No? And this, the, the, the relation between the non-integral dimension and the uh, uh, harmonic trap was discussed, I mean, uh, quite recently by Garrido and Jensen, uh, where they look at the, the relation of the uh, oscillator length divided by the true body, three body root mean square radius in 2D. So uh, they, they found a simple formula playing just with harmonic uh, oscillator potentials for the three body. And they check this formula with uh, a Gaussian potential, Morse potential, and they indeed see that this simple formula are able to, to really to, to, to give, I mean, uh, the, the, relation between the dimension and the uh, and this ratio so these are computed trimers with gaussian potential more potential and they really nicely follow that so at least there is an indication that we can translate the no integer dimension to the uh, harmonic oscillator length in one of the directions that we are squeezing. Okay, so now we, we computed, I mean, we went uh, beyond uh, three identical trimers. So this was the work by Derek in his PhD with Marcelo. And then uh, when we have a system, AAB system, and this is just the mass ratio between the B and A. No? So this here, in this side, you have, uh, these are three identical, that was indeed found by, uh, by news and collaborators. What is the region of dimension that you can have FMOV effect? There you see the boundaries, you can squeeze up to about uh, 2.3, that still you have a FMOV effect. Uh, you can go above even with dimension 3.8. And this is just the mass ratio between the B and A. So this is the heavy, heavy light, and this is light, light, heavy. And then, of course, you see that you can go even to smaller dimensions when you have a, a heavy, heavy light system. So it's more resilient because the distance between the FMOV states are smaller. And let us say the strength of the one R square potential is larger for heavy, heavy light systems. And this is a perspective of, of this is just the square root of two consecutive FMOV states, then you can see here when you move in dimension. And of course, when you, 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 you are close to this boundary, the distance between the FMOV states or the, 
the two consecutive states start to increase up to infinity. And this is what we see in this plot. So we have here several C's, three identical particles, that, uh, and then you see that the ratio between the state and the excited one increase to infinity. So essentially the uh, excited state disappear, should disappear. Yeah. Okay. And uh, indeed, uh, more recently, uh, Derek uh, was able to derive even the wave function, including the energy of the trimer. So this is just a sketch. We are able to get even with, we use Betty Pio's boundary condition. This was a work uh, with Gaston and Marcelo. And uh, with Betty Pio's boundary condition in D dimensions, we are able even to have the analytic uh, wave function. So this is the FADF component. So you have three of that. And uh, we can even use to analyze not only atomic system, but maybe uh, nuclear systems. And this is uh, in the, what we say, in the unitary, li unitary limit or when the scattering lens goes to infinity. And then you see here the log periodic oscillations. So this is one example for the uh, uh, cesium. Uh, yes, is this lithium cesium rubidium system? It's just uh, one one uh, one example. And then we see the log periodic oscillations. But when you go to the radius to zero, of course. The energy, so this means long distance, the binding energy matters, and then this is stop the oscillation. This kappa naught is just kappa naught square. We define it at two times the energy. Uh, and then, of course, this is just the two distance. We have rho and r, so we could play even with this wave function. But the continuum, we have not done. Okay. So let, what happens now if we increase the number of particles? So first, I will go to three, to four, three dimensions, four bosons. What we discovered quite some time ago together uh, with Marcelo, Lauro, and our colleague Antonio Delfino, so quite time ago, that uh, in principle we could have another scale when we go to the four boson system. So these are just the fadev yakubovsky equations. I'm just to, just to emphasize that we have, we can regulate these equations in the limit of zero range uh, interaction, uh, giving the freedom to have another scale. Of course, if you have two and three body potentials, you are um, constrained by the scale. But this uh, uh, mathematical construction allows you to move. So this indeed could be interpreted as a four body force. And then what we found, as we move the four body scale, I mean the short range four body scale uh, to smaller and smaller distance, this is in the unitarity limit when the scattering length is infinite. The states comes from the trimer threshold. So exactly like we saw with Ephimov, but this is another cycle. And indeed, when we computed that, so this is the cycle, these are other potentials. You see there are even uh, uh, calculations that follows this cycle. So this is the ratio, these are dimensionless ratios between the trimer energy and the uh, tetramer energy. And this is the excited state, uh, tetramer uh, with respect to the trimer. So these are dimensionless quantity. And we see that we have another uh, geometric ratio. So in principle, we should have interwoven cycles. No? Of course, uh, this interval means that we need a four-body scale. And indeed, 
In the effective field theory recently, it was found that at next to leading order is possible to move the tetramer state. So okay, so yes. Uh, okay, have... I'm almost at the end. <laughs> Great. So now we go to, we do the Bohr Oppenheimer approximation. We can go to many particles. So we just allow light heavy interaction or heavy light. So with the Born Oppenheimer approximation, the effective interaction between the two, the two heavy, the two heavy, sorry, is my. Okay, the two heavy, I mean, have a long range potential that depends now the strength on the number of particles. Therefore, the geometric ratio between the states will be different than the FMOV ratio. And then uh, as long as you have this one over R squared potential, new limit cycles will appear. We have looked at this as a function of the dimension, no, recently. And of course you can tune what happens is that now the FMOV or the generalization of the FMOV factor will depend on dimension. So in principle, you can turn off cycles when you change dimension. Now, how to move three body scale or maybe four body scale. So that is the Van der Waals universality that says, okay, for uh, the position of the recombination um, res uh, resonance in uh, atomic traps uh, is the, uh, so this is the scattering length when the uh, primary energy goes to zero it is, is about nine uh, times the Van der Waals length. This is in the region of negative scattering length. And this has been understood by and is revised in this uh, nice paper by Naidon and Endo that just when you have the, the Van der Waals force, when you go to the Van der Waals radius, the potential just explodes and cut the wave form. So this gives you a scale. And uh, what happens? People indeed found that this is broken. And there is a recent paper by Chapurin and uh, Cornell and collaborators that indeed even for potassium found this strong deviation. And of course, when we are close to a, when, when you're, you have two channels and the closed channel is strongly coupled to the open channel, we can have, uh, for example, three body forces. And those three body forces can move. So, okay, so my summary. So we, I discussed, I mean, scale invariance breaking, FMOV and Thomas effects, the dimensional reduction and the suppression, of course, of the Thomas FMOV effect. Then I went to more bosons. So for bosons, there is a new cycle. Uh, then uh, scale invariance breaking in any bosons is Borel-Penheimer approximation indicates that maybe there are new cycles and dimension or schizy can turn off independently the cycles. Now the point is how this many body force we can uh, play or control. This I think is not yet well understood. So thank you for your attention. So thank Hello. you. Yes, okay. are you listening? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. So thank you very much for the talk. I think we have some time for questions. Yes. Thank you for the talk. Uh, about hollow states, you commented the hollow states in 3D systems. But nothing in, in 2D. Can you comment about the possibility of having hollow states also in 2D? Ah, yes. I mean, uh, this essentially 
maybe I, 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 I move it too fast, but uh, uh, yes, it's, it's possible to have. I mean, when we have, um, uh, for example, here I discussed mass asymmetric systems, no? Uh, that you can have uh, many states, but in principle, you could have, uh, I mean, halo, one heavy and two lights, no? I mean, uh, in principle, you could have, if you are able to tune uh, uh, your interaction. And indeed, I mean, uh, when you go to this uh, limit of zero range interaction, the halo properties will be completely determined by the dimer energy. Suppose you have, uh, I mean, your dimer, your uh, heavy light uh, dimer energy given, so your, your halo will be determined by that. No? Here I, I, I give the example of uh, two heavy and one light, but uh, in this plot, you can have uh, many things. So in principle, the answer to your question, yes. Hi, here's Axel speaking. Yes, hi, Axel. So I was wondering, uh, you analyze the dimensional crossover uh, via potential energy, right? In principle, uh, uh, the field of quantum gases also allows to think about a dimensional crossover from 3D to 2D via kinetic energy, in the sense that you have a stack of uh, pancake um, uh, uh, gases. So uh, with tuning then the hopping between the uh, longitudinal direction. So if there's no hopping, you are in 2D, uh, uh, but if you allow for a hopping from pancake to pancake to pancake, then you enter the 3D regime. And I'm just wondering whether the way how to uh, practically realize the dimensional crossover may have implications for the FMO physics. Yes, I mean, if you go, for example, you are thinking about many pancakes and you have your bosons just moving on the pancakes. Is that what you are thinking? Yes. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, this will be uh, a situation of 2D. Now, to go to the situation of 3D, you need to enlarge the pancake. No? Then you should allow the bosons to move. And this is an interesting thing because you could have, I mean, uh, one boson in 2D and the other boson in 3D. So people have discussed, for example, this kind of mixed dimensions, even. So in principle, yes. I mean, the Efimov effect, when you, when you squeeze, will disappear. But now, if you squeeze differently the particles, of course, in the 2D limit, it will disappear. But how it will disappear and when, I think is an open question. Okay, any other question? Yes, Wanderlei. Oi, Wanderlei. Hello? Hello, Hello. to me. Uh, hi, hi. Uh, well, I, I, my question is more like a comment, but uh, I want to see your point of view. Uh, this type of physics is, uh, is not new, right? We all know the original paper. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Of and so on. And uh, I think it's a very important topic because, uh, you know, we learned from the beginning how atoms can get together and here comes special uh, features associated with this few body physics. And uh, people like you and many others are being investigating uh, this topic for a long time. Uh, what I want to know from you is the better understanding of the topic made us to understanding other things better, right? And uh, so I want to know from you what the evolution of understanding the field body physics uh, improve our understanding of other phenomena in general. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, that is first, I think now one important point that is starting to raise is this problem of the uh, induced three body forces. I mean, this is yet is not controlled, no? This is by this, uh, we can see by this violation of the Van der Waals University, no? So if you know how to control the three body force, this is one boot or more, for example, in the, when we look to atomic condensates. This is one example. And uh, of course, uh, how uh, your, uh, uh, I mean, this three body, for example, interaction changes when you move your trap, uh, how I say, aspect ratio, 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 aspect ratio. I mean, is also uh, not understood. I think these are the directions that we could move. And, and the other interesting dimension, uh, direction is how those cycles that are interwoven, how they can appear. Because when one trimer passes the continuum, we have this uh, huge recombination resonance. When a tetramer pass to the continuum also, but when you manipulate, I mean, the, the, the trap in a way to create situations of asymmetry, I mean, going 2D, you may control better these effects, I mean. And the few body physics can give you a hint how uh, those uh, forces uh, I mean, how these uh, forces will change when you change, uh, I mean, your trap, no? I think this is something that could, uh, is a direction to go, uh, as I see, no? at this moment. And understand better these uh, interwoven cycles, no? This is something... Another that possibility is... to answer Wanderlei's challenging question is the following. I heard once a, a very nice talk from a Japanese colleague, a theorist, at a conference which was organized by Heidelberg University in Bad Honnef, and, and he had the vision to have not only pair, uh, Cooper pairs uh, uh, be, be, yes, but somehow uh, that was many, many years back. So somehow I never heard about that anymore. So I, I don't know. At least theoretically, uh, you can calculate some very nice phase diagrams. And I think that would be a, a, a quantum jump to transport this few particle physics of, of Efimov states into the many body realm, right? Yes, I mean, if you are able, for example, if you have quasi-particles that behaves as bosons, for example, or different particles, you can, in principle, uh, see those uh, FMOV physics and generalizations of it to more particles. Because if there is this kind of cycles, it will not stop in three, can be in four, five, and so on. And if you create this effective degree of freedom of, of par or even triples that, uh, that are bosons and so on, and they interact among them, maybe this, uh, you can see also this, uh, I mean, uh, kind of universal physics, no? That doesn't need to be the atom itself, can be the molecules or the, or the effective degree of freedom that you have. Okay, uh, so I think we are running out of time. So okay. I would like Thank to you. be us once again. Okay, I will stop sharing now. So thank you, Tobias. Okay, thank you. So um, we should move to our next speaker that is also going to be online. If I'm not mistaken, it's from our direct. It's not from Azure. It's... <laughs>
Yes. So, hi, Tommaso. Can you hear me? Hi, Patricia. Yes. Yes. Hi. You can see me, right? I, I see myself in the big screen. Yes, yes. You are in the big screen. Okay. So, should I share the screen? Yeah, you can. Okay. Can you, I think you, I guess you can see it, right? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, so, I just one second to adjust the okay. my so settings here. Yeah. Is ready. I think we can move to our next speaker, that is Tommaso Macri. And uh, Tommaso, he is a professor at the University Federal, uh, oh, sorry, Federal, Federal, Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Norte, so here in Brazil, in Natal. And, but this last year he has been in the US. I'm not sure what he's doing there. Maybe he will tell us, I don't know. <laughs> but okay, so that's why he's online. So thank you, Tommaso. And uh, I give you the, the speak. You can start whenever you want. Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you so much for, for the introduction, Patricia. Uh, it's a great pleasure to to have the opportunity to share some ideas with uh, with all of you. Uh, of course, I would have uh, uh, wanted to to come uh, to, to be there with you guys uh, uh, a lot, uh, but um, unfortunately, I was not able to travel at this time. I heard from the previous talk the voice of Axel. So hi, Axel. Um, I hope that we can see we can meet in person soon, as well as uh, Van der Ley. I also want to acknowledge uh, for the invitation, Arnaldo. Uh, I don't know if he's uh, in the audience right now, um, but again, it, it's, it's been really, it would be really great to see ourselves in person uh, very soon. Uh, so today I promise that I will not take uh, too much time. Uh, I see that, uh, the, I, I know that the conference is finishing, the workshop is finishing soon, but uh, still I want to, to talk a little bit about these ideas uh, related to the so-called quantum boomerang effect uh, in uh, localized systems. And to do that, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, some of my uh, closest collaborators uh, that helped me to uh, uh, get a better understanding of this effect uh, throughout the last couple of years. So I would like to start from uh, uh, thanking uh, Flavio and Arsenio, who are postdocs at uh, the Federal University of Rio del Norte, Santiago, who is a second-year PhD student, uh, who is actually there in the audience with you. Um, he developed, uh, is currently working on the so-called classical, classical analog of this uh, boomerang effect. And uh, of course, if you guys have uh, any questions uh, regarding that uh, this topic, please uh, just ask uh, Santiago. I guess he would be very happy to, to explain uh, his recent findings. And uh, also, I would like to acknowledge uh, very fruitful discussions and collaborations with uh, Patrizia Vignolo from Nice, as well as uh, uh, David Weld from uh, UCSB, from the University of California, Santa Barbara, with uh, whom we actually collaborated to uh, demonstrate experimentally the quantum boomerang effect in the so-called quantum kick and rotor model that I will discuss uh, briefly at the end uh, of this presentation. So the talk today will be focused mostly on these first three works that have been published uh, uh, last year. And uh, again, uh, if you have questions regarding the classical version, please uh, refer to, uh, to Santiago. Okay. So I would like to start uh, basically providing some context for this uh, boomerang effect uh, uh, by basically uh, reviewing the physics of the uh, prototypical uh, Anderson model in one dimension, which is a single particle hopping model with constant hopping uh, J and uh, on-site energies uh, uh, epsilon i, which vary randomly uh, within an interval of uh, width uh, w from minus w, w over two to w over two. So an important result uh, in the context of Anderson localization in one dimension is that uh, all the eigenstates are uh, uh, are essentially localized. Uh, there have been uh, several experimental realizations of uh, Anderson localizations in, in a wide spectrum of physical systems, 
probably the one that uh, you are uh, um, that we are mostly aware of are those with, with within the field of cold atoms, but also other physical systems like lighting fibers or lighting biological media display similar effects. What we see here in the figures on the on the right is essentially the so-called experimental verification of this uh, localization property when we uh, release uh, a, an initially a prepared wave packet within an harmonic trap uh, after a certain amount of time at T, what we observe is that the uh, width of the system essentially saturates to a constant value in the presence of a, an external random potential whereas uh, it uh, grows uh, linearly in time uh, as we already as we know from elementary quantum mechanics uh, in the absence of an external uh, random potential another important result is that as you can see the tails uh, of the distribution are essentially exponentially uh, localized so again i want to highlight that this is a characteristic of the 1d uh, in uh, higher dimensions the physics uh, is slightly different i will mention uh, some results uh, uh, later on. So the, the boomerang, to understand the boomerang effect, uh, uh, the physics uh, essentially is very similar. The, the we can take the same Anderson model that we have seen in the previous slide, but now we want to understand what is the dynamics in the presence of uh, an initial uh, uh, momentum kick. So again, we have a, a random potential, uh, basically trivially sch uh, schematized by this uh, continuous uh, black line here. We prepare an initial Gaussian wave packet, uh, but now with the, uh, we, we imprint a phase uh, given by this moment with this momentum cannot that basically kicks uh, the wave packet in one direction, for example, along the positive uh, uh, x-axis. And we wonder what is the dynamics uh, after sufficient long times of this initially uh, kicked wave packet. So the, uh, this question, although it looks like very elementary from the physical perspective, it was uh, nicely described in this uh, uh, PRA paper by Dominique Deland and Nicolas Chehore a few years ago. And uh, uh, basically, mathematically, the problem is again, very simple to be described. So if we take, uh, we, we want to compute the average uh, position as a function of time. So we need to compute this integral of x multiplied by the density as a function of, at time t. And uh, uh, we start with the Gaussian initial wave packet for simplicity. So you, here you, you, we have a normalization constant, time Gaussian, times uh, a phase factor e to i k naught uh, x. Now, if we uh, blindly uh, uh, start to uh, analyze this problem from a purely classical perspective, so let's take, uh, for example, a purely a Brownian particle within a medium. And uh, what we would obtain is that if we keep, if we, if the initial part, if the particle is uh, static at the very beginning, we would observe that the particle would start uh, again realizing a Brownian motion and it will spread uh, over time uh, symmetrically around uh, uh, the initial position at x equal to x equal to zero. If we instead uh, we kick the particle uh, in one direction, let's say to the to the positive uh, direction of uh, the x-axis, what we would observe uh, in this uh, uh, classical Brownian analog is that uh, it will uh, initially uh, move ballistically and then it will uh, um, saturate to a constant uh, value. So essentially the particle will move initially ballistically and then it will uh, end up at a finite position uh, x equal to L, where L is of the order of the mean free path of, uh, of the system. Now it turns out that uh, in the quantum analog, so in the presence when we study the, the Anderson model um, in one dimension, the physics is actually quite different from the, this classical analog. And in particular, let me also add, I hi highlight that this, uh, uh, specifically the physics of this classical analog is what we are actually currently investigating to make a, a more clear parallelism between this quantum boomerang effect and what happens in uh, uh, classical subdiffusive uh, systems. So again, uh, if you have questions, we, are, uh, we, can, uh, we can discuss about that uh, at the end of the presentation. But now we want to focus purely on the, on the quantum, in the quantum regime, to the quantum regime. <clears throat> so here what we see 
let's focus first on these figures on, on the right. We uh, plot the center of mass position as a function of time t. Um, and what we observe is that initially, the, uh, we take, uh, again, another important uh, thing is that we take an uh, average over several realizations. We see that initially particle, the particle spreads uh, and moves ballistically, and then uh, it makes a U-turn, and for large times, uh, it returns to the, to the origin, which is sort of ca quite uh, counterintuitive, right? Especially if we compare this behavior with the classical, uh, with the classical one. The picture on the right, on the left, instead displays the uh, probability density. We see again this sort of uh, um, uh, light cone behavior uh, that, of course, spreads uh, symmetrically with respect to the uh, position x equal to zero, which is the origin. So initially, we have again this wave packet, which is very much localized around x equal to zero. But now we plot uh, the uh, this density as a function of time. And we observe that, uh, of course, initially, as the particle spreads ballistically, like, like in the, part, like in the uh, picture on the right, uh, we see that there is an enhanced probability density that moves uh, along the positive x-axis. But then, uh, if we compute the average, which is given by this uh, dashed, dashed line, we see that there is a concentration of uh, uh, probability density around the origin, which is also consistent with the picture of uh, uh, localization in the sense that uh, eventually the, the system is always localized, so the particle will always end up uh, into uh, basically being localized within a region of uh, uh, the order of the localization length of the system. But a counterintuitive fact in this respect is the fact that the particle indeed goes back. So it first moves uh, ballistically, but then it goes back uh, to, the, to the origin. Now, this is uh, basically the, the, the main result for the case of a one-dimensional uh, one dimensional system. What happens if we extend the, the same uh, um, study to the three-dimensional case? Well, in 3D, uh, we know that the physics of the Anderson model is uh, slightly different. There is a metal insulator transition as a function of uh, the strength of the disorder uh, W. In particular, for, uh, for uh, uh, the small disorder, the system is delocalized, whereas for large disorder, in particular, above a certain threshold of the disorder, that for the 3D Anderson model takes the value of uh, 16.5, the system instead, all the eigenstates will be instead localized. So if we take a sufficiently small disorder, then uh, what we will have is that there will be enough uh, mm, eigenstates which, which are delocalized and overlap uh, with uh, the initial state uh, psi x, uh, x naught, so with uh, our initial Gaussian wave packet. And what we observe is that if we plot the uh, average value, of, so the center of mass position as a function of time, it will uh, essentially converge uh, to, to a constant value, which is sort of consistent with that diffusive feature that we have seen at the very beginning. However, if we instead cross this threshold value of the, of the disorder and look uh, at the same uh, uh, center of mass position for large times and large disorder, we see that instead the center of mass goes back uh, uh, to the origin. So we observe again this physics of the quantum boomerang effect. Now, the other important observation re relative to this uh, three-dimensional case is that uh, the boomerang it, uh, effect itself can be, sort of, can be used as a sort of probe for uh, uh, detecting the position of, this, uh, of the um, um, metal insulator transition. Indeed, uh, by doing uh, a rescaling of the position of the center of mass by time uh, with a certain power t to one third, which is essentially what it is observed in the case of the critical uh, at the critical point, we observe that there is a nice uh, crossing of these curves uh, at uh, precisely the, the value uh, 16.5, which is consistent with the other results uh, in the context of the 3D uh, Anderson model. Now, the question that uh, we tried to answer uh, was uh, to provide an interpretation or sort of a deeper interpretation to these numerical results uh, that were uh, presented in this paper in 2019. Now, it turns out that uh, the, the physics of the quantum boomerang effect uh, is actually very much related to both, uh, of course, localization, but also to the uh, intrinsic symmetries of uh, 
the class of disordered Hamiltonians that we are considering, considering as well as the symmetries of the uh, initial state, uh, which we take uh, in this particular case as a Gaussian wave packet. But as you can see, we could take uh, an, an initial arbitrary uh, wave packet uh, with different properties than the one that we are uh, looking at uh, at the moment. So let me walk through the, um, the discussion of how symmetries actually become relevant in the um, sort of proof of this quantum boomerang effect. We will focus in particular for this example in 1D, but I will show in a, in a minute uh, uh, an example in two dimensions uh, just to contextualize that the, this framework works uh, uh, in a more general setup. Now, let's uh, consider reflection, uh, which maps uh, position X into minus X, and uh, time reversal symmetry, which maps uh, T to minus T. Here we consider a class of uh, uh, disordered Hamiltonians, which are invariant under RT. So in particular, the action of the uh, reflection time inverse reversal symmetry into onto this class maps this class of Hamiltonians into the same class. We take, uh, for example, a single realization of uh, the Anderson model in 1D. This is, of course, not invariant under RT. It is invariant under time reversal because the coefficients are real, but it is clearly not invariant under reflection symmetry. In particular, the uh, on-site energy at site J is not equal to the on-site energy, not necessarily equal to the on-site energy at site minus J. However, given a certain realization of the Anderson model in 1D, we can map, we can, uh, by applying uh, a, um, by applying uh, RT, so by applying reflection and time reversal symmetry, we map it into a different realization, which still belongs to the same class of Hamiltonians uh, that belong to the 1D Anderson model. So if we take uh, uh, as a whole the set of uh, uh, disordered Hamiltonians that uh, are described by the Anderson model, they are instead, yes, they are, uh, they are indeed uh, uh, invariant under RT, but singular realizations uh, not necessarily uh, display the same type of symmetry. So this is one uh, fact. So this, this is what we, what we get if we focus on uh, reflection time reversal symmetry on the Hamiltonians. What happens instead if we focus on, if we apply the same uh, reflection time symmetry into the initial, uh, onto the initial state? Well, we observe that if we apply RT into Psi X not, what we get is that Clearly, time reversal symmetry will uh, uh, take A, so the constant, the prefactor, trivially to the complex conjugate. It will leave unaffected the Gaussian term, but instead will make, will uh, map the phase E to minus E to I K naught X into E to minus K naught X. Now, if we, instead, if we apply R on top of this uh, um, time reversal symmetry initial state, time reversal symmetry initial state, what we get is that uh, a will, become, will still be a, a complex conjugate of A. The Gaussian will remain unaffected, but now the uh, E to minus I K naught X will go back to I E K naught X. So if we neglect uh, trivially, or if we take a, a constant prefactor, a real prefactor A or normalization prefactor A, we observe that this particular initial state is an eigenstate of uh, a reflection time uh, symmetry. So far, so good. Of course, if you have questions, just either interrupt me or uh, we can uh, clarify all these uh, uh, points at the very end. Now, if we assume that our initial, uh, the, the class of, uh, uh, of Hamiltonians are invariant under RT, and the initial state is an eigenstate of uh, uh, reflection time symmetry, what we are interested in to Car computing again is the center of mass uh, position as a function of time. So now we need to focus on the uh, density of the system at times t. This can be actually expanded uh, in terms of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, which are here represented by uh, phi n and phi m. There are these uh, phase factors here, which are the dynamical phases that appear when you perform time evolution. And these epsilon n and epsilon m are the eigenvalues of the system. Now, since the eigenstates are, are localized, the system is in general constrained to a volume 
uh, given by the uh, localization length, which is proportional to the mean free path of the system. This also defines a typical level spacing delta, which is the inverse of the density of states times the localization length, with a corresponding localization time, which is proportional to h bar divided by the, um, this level spacing. Now, beyond that characteristic localization time, essentially all the oscillatory terms vanish, and we end up into an expression, uh, psi x or average value over realizations uh, at sufficiently large times. So not necessarily infinity, but times which are much larger than the localization times, which is given by uh, essentially what we would call uh, um, the uh, diagonal ensemble. So we, we take just the diagonal terms of this expansion of the density in terms of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Now, another important fact is that uh, this expression is actually independent of the sign of time. So we would get uh, essentially the same expression, whether we are propagating uh, forward in time or backward in time, right? Now, if we compute uh, the average value, the expectation value of the position operator into the class of Hamiltonians given by H, or actually to be more precise into a specific, for a specific realization, of this class of Hamiltonians H, what we will get if we now apply RT and RT minus one to this, uh, uh, to the expression for the expectation value, we would get that uh, basically, since the initial state uh, is taken to be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, of the RT, and in particular, if we take uh, A to be a real, the prefactor to be a real constant, we get either plus or minus, and this plus or minus uh, can be uh, oops, can be uh, generically generically appear whether we take uh, either Gaussians or uh, which are of course symmetric with respect to the origin or anti-symmetric. Uh, in that case, uh, we would multiply this Gaussian time by a, a node fact a node power of uh, of the position of, of the position x. In that case, we would get either plus or minus. The same things the same thing takes place uh, at uh, for the for the cat. Epsi naught, but uh, the magic uh, takes place in the in the middle of part of this expression where we have these uh, uh, the propagators. So e to i h dagger t or and e to minus uh, uh, i h t. So if we have an emission Hamiltonian h dagger is equal to h, so there is no no problem. But this effect actually also generalized to the case of non emission Hamiltonians. I will not spend time on that, but if you have questions, we can discuss about that uh, uh, later. So again, if we now map, uh, if you apply RT to this uh, exponential here, we will map a single realization H into a new realization of uh, uh, our disordered class of Hamiltonians that we will call uh, H tilde, okay, which is given by the application of, of RT into the Hamiltonian H. And then in, uh, if we uh, apply RT on the operator X, what we will get is that a time, of course, that does not, time reversal symmetry will not affect x, but reflection symmetry maps and x into minus x. So we'll gain a minus sign in front of this expression here. So by um, uh, applying this, uh, consecutively these uh, RT operators uh, into this expression, we get that the expectation value of the position at time t for a single realization of the Hamiltonian of the disordered Hamiltonian H is equal to minus the expectation value at times minus T, where uh, of course T, uh, the, 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 the T ma is mapped into minus T by applying the, the time reversal operator uh, capital T for uh, computed for a, a for a, a new uh, realization of the disordered uh, system uh, given by H tilde. And now what we do is do we average over all the disordered realizations. And therefore, if we average over all the disordered realizations, what we get is that uh, the, this average at time x at time t equal to plus infinity is equal to minus the uh, expectation, the average of the expectation value taken at times so equal to minus uh, infinity. On the other hand, the fact that the probability density instead is invariant under time reversal, so from, from t to minus t, we end up 
into so the only way in which this expression here is compatible with this expression here is that for sufficiently large times the expectation the average of the expectation value of the position goes uh, is equal to zero which is precisely the um, uh, proof of the fact that we have the uh, so-called quantum boomerang effect. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that, uh, uh, so I apologize for uh, taking so much time to uh, basically highlight the uh, sort of analytical um, motivation for this boomerang effect. I want to now focus on uh, some, some numerical results that uh, essentially highlight how this um, a symmetry based proof of the boomerang effect is actually relatively powerful. I want to focus uh, uh, into a so called uh, to a so called uh, uh, to the so called Harper Anderson model, which is essentially the same Anderson model that we have seen before in two dimensions. We consider the case of sufficient strong disorder, and on top of that, we add some fluxes that penetrate the, the plaquettes. Uh, of these two dimensional square lattice um, Anderson model. So in this case, of course, uh, we expect that the time reversal symmetry is of course broken by the presence of a time reversal. But on the other hand, what we are actually interested in uh, as a matter of fact, is the, uh, the invariance of this class of disordered Hamiltonian under the simultaneous applications of not only time reversal, but also reflection symmetry. And if you consider the symmetries of these phases that you need to attach to the Anderson model for, for this, for the, to the under, upper Anderson model to be effectively representing a, a, a model that uh, uh, displays uh, a magnetic field, so in the presence of a magnetic field, you end up uh, demonstrating essentially that uh, the, uh, I mean, the class of uh, disorder Hamiltonians represented by the upper Anderson model is indeed invariant under the simultaneous applications of application of reflection and time symmetry. Now, what is not invariant under uh, the simultaneous application of RNT is uh, the initial state. In particular, the initial state uh, along uh, the initial state is invariant under uh, RNT along the direction x. So, if you take again reflection with respect to x, you see that. The same argument that we uh, that I was discussing before applies, so this is indeed an eigenstate. But if you instead apply reflection time symmetry, where the reflection is taken along the y-axis, this is not this is of course not an eigenstate, and it is not an eigenstate because when you apply R, you get uh, basically this uh, R y, this uh, phase factor remains uh, remains unchanged, whereas if you apply T. You, you get uh, a minus i cannot uh, x. So trivially, this phase fact, this, uh, um, this initial state is not invariant under the simultaneous application of uh, Ry and t. So what is the outcome of this? Is that uh, basically this argument that we developed uh, here on the left part of uh, the left part of the slide does not necessarily hold for the case of uh, the Harper Anderson model along one of the two directions, and specifically along the y direction. So this can be clearly seen when we uh, monitor the dynamics of this wave packet, which is initially uh, localized around the origin. And what we see is that initially the, the wave packet will try to perform a, a sort of cyclotron orbit because we have a, a, a magnetic field that penetrates the uh, that crosses the, the two-dimensional uh, square lattice. But after a certain point, basically the disorders start to play a role. And what we see is that the, the system performs a, a, the analog of a U-turn, but now in two dimensions. It goes back. You see that it goes back, it goes back to the, for sufficient large times. It essentially wants to reach the uh, initial value of uh, uh, the x-axis, which is the, basically x equal to zero. But on the other hand, along the y-axis, it does not go to zero. And this is, again, a reflection of the fact that the, this argument for the, um, for the boomerang does not hold along the y-direction. This can be done a little bit more explicitly if we uh, separate the dynamics along the two different directions. And what we see is that uh, along the x-axis, indeed, we see that this nice U-turn. 
and the system wants to go back to the to the origin for sufficiently long times. Along the y direction, instead, where this uh, reflection time symmetry is indeed uh, instead broken, we see that the, again ballistic motion for small times, but then uh, the system uh, the the y uh, coordinate saturates uh, to essentially a constant for sufficiently large times. So in two dimensions here for strong disorder, what we observe is that there is a, a partial breaking of the boomerang effect due to the fact that the initial state is not an eigenstate of, uh, of the system, of the, of the class, of the, sorry, of the simultaneous application of reflection and time symmetries. Now, so far so good. Uh, now I want to slightly change gears and discuss uh, an apparently totally unrelated model uh, with respect to the, the class of uh, disorder at Hamiltonians that I was uh, considering before. And I want to move uh, to the so-called uh, classical, uh, to the quantum key quadrator model, which has a very famous classical counterpart, which is uh, called the classical key quadrator model, which is again, a, a sort of representation of what uh, a very famous dynamical uh, a map in classical uh, dynamical system, which is called the Chirikov map. Now, the classical Kicked rotor is essentially that essentially represents the dynamics of a particle or a pendulum, if you wish, where the uh, the gravity, which uh, were described by this uh, potential with strength uh, k cosine theta, is uh, switched on uh, periodically in time, where the period is represented is labeled by this uh, uh, capital T here. Now, it turns out that classically, this model is actually quite rich. Uh, if you look uh, at these uh, phase portraits uh, for different values of, uh, of k, uh, so the strength of this uh, um, uh, potential energy, what we observe is that for, la uh, for small values of k, the system displays regular orbits. But then if we cross a certain threshold value, these, uh, the system essentially displays a completely chaotic, uh, completely chaotic motion. Now, one might wonder why am I, I am introducing uh, this model, what is the relation of this model with the, the uh, topic that I was discussing before. Well, the reason is that the kicked uh, rotor in the quantum regime can be mapped into a one-dimensional uh, Anderson model with a diagonal uh, pseudo disorder and uh, an exponential localized opt-in uh, opt channels. These, uh, uh, Observation, of course, is not ours. It's well known uh, in the literature. It dates back to the, to the 80s. There are, there are some works by Kazati and Warnier, Spelianski, and others that essentially prove that the, the mapping of uh, the quant quantum kicked rotor into an Anderson model in momentum space. Uh, we can go very quickly through this uh, derivation, but of course, I would like to point out to the original uh, uh, references uh, if you want to have a clear understanding of this mapping. But I would say it's actually quite interesting. So let me just briefly sketch the, the proof. So if we start from the quantum kicked rotor, where we promote both the momentum and the position to operators, and we uh, study the, evol the evolution of the system through this uh, uh, flow operator, where this V is essentially is, is proportional, to, is uh, equal to the uh, strength of, the, uh, of these kicks, K times uh, cosine theta. If we rewrite uh, this uh, potential energy uh, term of the, of the propagator in terms of uh, uh, an auxiliary uh, operator M, capital M, and uh, introduce the Floquet uh, quasi energies uh, E alpha, we can rewrite the, uh, eigen, the um, eigen energy uh, equation in terms of this operator M. By introducing, again, an auxiliary vector psi alpha, which we expand in terms of the momentum basis given by these m uh, cats, we finally end up into an eigenvalue equation, which resembles very much the um, eigenvalue equation of a, a 1D lattice model with uh, uh, local energies uh, epsilon n, which are given by these uh, sort of pseudo random uh, numbers given by the tangent of, this, uh, uh, of the Floquet quasi energies uh, minus uh, uh, n squared. Now, I, I, the quantum kicked rotor model is also very well known uh, uh, in uh, the literature, not only for uh, really several theoretical uh, um, discussions, 
but also for uh, uh, many experimental realizations. And here I uh, just uh, comment, uh, I just mentioned a few of them, uh, but if you're interested, there are very many uh, other uh, references in the literature and we can discuss about that. Uh, if you're interested, just reach out to me and we can, I'm super interested about this topic. Now, what I would like instead to point out is that uh, the uh, experimental verification of the quantum boomerang effect uh, into this model. So we saw what is the link. So the link is that the quantum uh, uh, kick rotor can be mapped into an Anderson model in momentum space. So since at the very beginning of this presentation, we highlighted the uh, nice features of the quantum boomerang effect into Anderson-like models, we would expect that if we investigate the dynamics of uh, uh, the quantum kick rotor in momentum space, so if we monitor the dynamics of a wave packet now in momentum space, we might be able to recover the physics of the uh, boomerang effect. This is indeed what was done, what we, what we did in collaboration with the, the group of David Weld at the UCSB. And what you see here is a, essentially a sketch of the dynamical protocol uh, that uh, they used in the, in the experiment. So they prepared a, a, um, a Gaussian wave packet, which is initially uh, um, basically uh, centered in, around a, a, a site of, uh, of a standing wave, so an optical lattice. And then after a time alpha t, where alpha is for now, it's an arbitrary number that monitors that uh, basically enters into the definition of this uh, Floquet uh, and flow of this Floquet operator, the Floquet dynamical uh, propagator. We, um, they start kicking this optical lattice with a phase shifted uh, uh, optical lattice. So you see that there is some phase difference between the initial optical lattice labeled by this uh, blue curve and the uh, dynamical uh, so, and the, the kicked optical lattice, which is switched on and off periodically in time with period uh, capital T. Now, the shift in the, uh, between the two optical lattices basically represents a kick, is the equivalent of a kick now in uh, real space. Because uh, we are now, the, the important thing uh, that to keep in mind is that the optical lattice, the, um, sorry, the, the quantum kick and rotor is mapped into an Anderson model in momentum space. So if we attach a phase with an initial kick in momentum in the real space Anderson model, we need to hear, we need to hear a kick in real space, which represents basically the analog of the uh, momentum space kick in the real counterpart of the Anderson model. So after that, after a certain number of, after a variable number of kicks, we they perform a time of flight measurements, uh, which uh, give us uh, access to the momentum space distribution of the VC. And we monitor uh, the expectation value of this uh, uh, momentum distribution. What we observe is that uh, is a dynamics which is very similar to the dynamics of the uh, real space uh, um, Anderson model. So here we see a U-turn and then nicely the uh, wave packet or the uh, center of mass in momentum space saturates uh, to a constant which is uh, compatible uh, essentially with zero. So again, uh, a confirmation of the uh, boomerang effect. There is a tricky point here too. To, there are some uh, technicalities. Uh, let me just mention one of them. So the initial, uh, the real initial state is uh, invariant under uh, the application of complex conjugation, we just take uh, an initial state, which is a real state at the end of the day. But then um, what we end up by applying the properties of this uh, uh, Floquet quasi operator, so this Floquet uh, propagator, we end up into some, in having some relationships between the average, the expectation value of the momentum after some, after a M kicks with a gauge factor one minus alpha, which is related to the average momentum after minus, so if we propagate back in time, minus m, analog to the, the most, to the proof that we were uh, discussing in the very beginning, with phase, with gauge, gauge factor uh, alpha. So in particular, if we focus on alpha equal one alpha, we end up uh, with uh, uh, this relation here, the second line. And then by applying, uh, by um, 
recalling the localization property, which gives rise to essentially a so-called uh, diagonal ensemble, where the probability density is independent of time for sufficient for the is independent of the sign of time for sufficiently long times, we end up by proving that the average momentum for sufficient long times for alpha equal one half is equal to zero. This can be, of course, also checked experimentally if we uh, essentially initialize these peaks with the variable number with the variable time uh, t. And we observe that uh, uh, indeed, uh, only in the case where alpha is one half or very close to one half, the momentum saturates to uh, vanishes for a sufficiently long uh, after a sufficiently large number of kicks. Instead, if we take alpha, which is far from one half, in particular 0 0.3 or 0 0.7, we end up uh, into a constant value, which is far from, uh, far from zero. In particular, this is minus 0 0.1 and this is 0 0.1. A second important observation before uh, concluding is that uh, we observe uh, a breaking of the boomerang uh, when, we, uh, when we essentially uh, stochastically kick uh, our, our condensate. And this is related to the breaking of localization. Indeed, if we monitor the energy, the kinetic energy as a function of the number of kicks in the localized, so in uh, for periodic kicks, uh, we observe that the kinetic energy essentially uh, goes to a constant. But instead, uh, if we kick stochastically, the average momentum, the average kinetic energy increases. And uh, the counterpart in the uh, observation or uh, of the, of the um, boomerang effect is that in the periodically kicked uh, uh, rotor, we observe that the momentum indeed uh, goes to zero. Instead, uh, in the stochastically kicked, uh, the breaking of localization also implies uh, that the Long term, long time uh, behavior of the average momentum goes to a constant value, which is not, not zero. So, to conclude uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, I wanted to guide you through the physics of the uh, so called quantum boomerang effect, which can also which can be used as a solid test also for uh, Anders localization. I comment briefly, uh, sketched the, the, uh, the proof. And uh, the uh, fact that uh, uh, symmetries are actually very relevant to the understanding of the microscopic uh, derivation of the uh, quantum boomerang effect. Quantum boomerang effect can be also easily generalizable, generalizable to many particle systems in the non interacting limit. The, the, most, the proof is essentially the same, it works for both the bosons and fermions. And uh, we were also able to prove. Uh, uh, using very simple arguments that uh, mean field interactions in general destroy the boomerang. There was also, uh, this we can be found in our PRB letters that we published last year with Flavio. And there is more recently a more, much uh, uh, more <laughs> detailed study by uh, Dominique Deland in a PRB paper that appeared uh, earlier this year. And finally, in the second part, I wanted to highlight uh, how the boomerang effect can indeed be experimentally observed in an apparently unrelated model, which is the quantum kicked rotor, which, however, displays the displays under localization in momentum space. And therefore, the quantum, the boomerang effect is indeed there if we not only study it theoretically, but also experimentally in, in the lab. So with this, I would like to, to conclude and thank you for uh, your attention. Hello. I cannot. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Are you listening, Tommaso? Yes. 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 I can. So thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrice. Any questions? I don't. I cannot hear anything. Hello. Yeah. Now it's on. Uh, okay. Is, uh, is there any reason that uh, the same if? Van, van der Leij, is it van der? Leij? I cannot. I cannot really hear you. I. 
we, we are having a problem with the microphone here. Okay. Okay, I will try to be fast. Is there any reason why? Vanderlei could just hear, uh, is there any reason why? And then uh, it muted. Uh, Sorry, Tommaso, there is a new microphone that is coming. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, new microphone. Is there yes. any reason that uh, I should not expect it or I should expect the same effect with uh, light? Great question. I have a wave packet of light propagating and finding a very nice structure with some uh, randomness on the on the index of refraction would i find the equivalent effect so that, that's a very good question there are i think uh, uh, there are probably different uh, answers depending on the uh, physical realization i guess of uh, the model that uh, that you have in mind um in general i would say no <clears throat> there is there are no differences if you, if you can map the, the dynamics of the wave packet into the same uh, model that we are or the class of models that i briefly sketched there should be no difference at all i, I can be more specific if you want vanderlei but it, it might take uh, some time but we thought a little bit about that for example uh, um there is one uh, probably very simple analogy to the models that I was considering, which is probably the case of light propagating in uh, hot vapors, um, where you can uh, map the dynamics in, uh, in those systems into, by using, by basically mapping the Maxwell equations into a um, Schrodinger type of equation by using the so-called paraxial approximation. And we we haven't proven anything. We haven't thought uh, too deeply about that, but uh, you can see that there are uh, there are clear analogies, and I would expect essentially the same behavior. And clear, of course, the, the parallelism goes with uh, the fact that time would be replaced with the, with the propagation direction, for example. But I would say there is a clear analogy in terms of the equations, so I would expect it precisely the same behavior. Okay, another question. Hey, Tomas, uh, thank you for the lecture. I would like to know uh, if uh, quantum boomerang effect, could it be a, ne a necessary or a sufficient condition to observation of Anderson localization? How do you can characterize it? Uh, that's a very good question. Can, can, you, can you say your name? I, I unfortunately I cannot see. My name is Sheila. Sheila, hi. Um, that's a very good question. And indeed, uh, uh, this is something that we actually asked uh, quite a lot over the past year. And that's the reason why we decided to investigate the same, uh, uh, basically the, this very same question in the case of uh, also classical systems where you don't clearly have the physics of under localization, but still uh, you can observe a very similar physics uh, in uh, subdiffusive, uh, uh, in the case of subdiffusive dynamics, uh, when you have a particle which is uh, interacting with uh, an external bath. So of course, in the in the quantum case, uh, you don't have a bath. We, we don't have a bath. We could have, but we we just consider a static random potential. In the classical case, we started from uh, the from a Brownian particle interacting with uh, an external bath. A prototypical model is uh, the so-called uh, Caldera-legged model, for example, which, which you can take the, either the classical or the quantum version. And what you observe is that depending on the spectral properties of the bath, you can observe a dynamics which is very similar to the one that uh, we observe here. So you can indeed observe in some, uh, for some specific type of baths, uh, you, can, you can observe the boomerang effect. Now, I wouldn't call it uh, a quantum boomerang effect because you can have it uh, precisely in the pure classical uh, regime. And therefore, going back to, the, to your question, we believe uh, that uh, the quantum boomerang effect, the boomerang effect is not necessarily specific to the um, localized systems. They probably to be the, the most fair type of answer that I can give, uh, which 
probably would sort of complement the, the talk that I presented today, is that uh, the boomerang effect appears when you have, uh, in general, subdiffusive dynamics. The case of Unger's localization in 1D is very, very peculiar because you have absence of diffusion, so it's sort of extreme uh, regime. So if you, have, if you don't have diffusion, you don't, uh, you, you observe the boomerang. But also in the case where you observe subdiffusion, which means that the exponent of the width of the, uh, the exponent of the, uh, of the, um, so if you, if you map, if you study the evolution of the width of the wave, of the wave packet as a function of time, typically it will scale like uh, e to the power alpha. When alpha is smaller than one, you also observe uh, the boomerang effect when you monitor the center of mass position. So again, uh, the, uh, the, this boomerang effect uh, in our view, it's much more general than the one that we discussed over the past couple of years in these papers and these results that I display today. But this is still a little bit under investigation. So we will soon have uh, a preprint about that. Uh, Santiago is of course involved, my student, uh, and I look forward to discussing about that much more in the, in the near future. But thanks for the great question. Okay, next question. Uh, hello, Tommaso. Uh, nice talk. Uh, I want to ask you about the width of these experiments because you cannot do uh, a pulse uh, uh, exactly like a delta. You must have some width. How this width yeah. destroy or enhance? What happens when you make this width uh, bigger in this kicked rotor in the experiments? A great question. I guess you are Arnold, right? Is it? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> I. And uh, yes, so that's a very good question. Uh, that uh, this question has been uh, has been uh, discussed briefly in the I mean by our the experimental colleagues, uh, and uh, we observe that uh, it is quite robust to the to the shape of the um, of the kicks. So indeed, uh, you can take also Gaussian shape kicks uh, instead of really delta localized in time, and you observe. A very similar dynamics, so there is a relative relative robustness uh, of these of this effect uh, with respect to the shape of the kicks. Yes, uh, which, uh, it's interesting to analyze which scale it's not good uh, enough. Uh, what's the time scale of this pulse? The width of this pulse compared to which reference that you say, oh, this width is not good. You must be smaller than something. I think it's interesting to. To, to analyze uh, well it's right just, okay okay yes i don't i i don't know if we i don't remember honestly i don't re i don't remember if we did a systematic study of uh, of uh, of the boomerang uh, with respect to the um, the shape of the kicks or the duration of the kicks uh, but we can, i can certainly go back to the original uh, to, to our paper and try to have a look Yeah, thanks, uh, Tommaso, for the inspiring uh, talk. Let me ask the following. Um, the su most surprising feature of this boomerang effect is that there is a certain time scale when the particle returns. And the question would be now, uh, how does this time scale change with the disorder strength or the correlation length of the disorder? Okay, so first of all, hi, Axel. Uh, uh, really nice to... To see you, to by well, I don't see you, but uh, I can, I can, uh, I can hear you. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, the time scale uh, we believe is very much related to the localization time, uh, the one that we defined as the um, as the inverse of the basically inversely propor inversely proportional to the um, to the basically to the spectral uh, spectral gap, and. Uh, uh, it's a good question. We haven't investigated yet uh, as a function. So the, the question you're asking, how does that uh, U-turn time scales with the disorder strength, for example, or other parameters of the Hamiltonian? That's a very good question. I think no, no one has really studied that uh, in detail. Probably my guess is that you can prob possibly do some analytical calculations in the case of weak disorder. But I know that you are an expert, so perhaps you already have some uh, 
uh, some ideas on how to do that. But my guess is my my point is that probably you would observe that the the typical time scale in which you observe the U-turn is uh, proportional to the to the localization time, and that localization time depends uh, is a function of the uh, disorder strength. Then the analytical behavior, honestly, I don't really recall. Uh, we haven't done any calculations, but uh, I guess uh, you you can. Uh, you can guess some some values, uh, some dependence. You are very much experienced in, in that accent. Thank you. So, Tommaso, I also have a small comment. So, at the beginning, Please. you said that this uh, boomerang effect uh, could be associated with Anderson localization and could be used to uh, as a solid test for three G Anderson localization. Yeah. Uh, so my my point is that uh, on our work in Florence and also in uh, the Marcos work, it was pretty much clear the signature when you start localizing your system. The matter was how to calculate the energy in order to match this energy with the mobility edge. Right. So I don't know uh, if doing like with the boomerang effect we gain too much on it because the localization was pretty much clear when it started. It was a matter of knowing how to extract the energy of the system in order to really match it with the mobility edge energy. Right, right. So, so yeah. So it's the, nice that there is a connection, but I don't know if it helps that much on extracting the mobility edge itself. Probably extract the mobility edge and not much, extracting the critical uh, value of the disorder that was possibly the, the connection that, uh, that was identified in the original paper on the boomerang effect. I agree with you. This is, an, in a sense, this is a sort of global effect, uh, if, you, if you want, because uh, we are not really looking at the precise uh, shape or precise uh, energy of the eigenstates. This is not really what we have access to this uh, dynamical effect. What you have access to is a sort of global or integrated quantity, which is the uh, average position, so the center of mass of the wave packet. Now, the point is that the dynamics of the center of mass displays some features which uh, um, uh, which allow to, to distinguish between these two dynamical regimes, the one in which you are fully localized for sufficiently strong disorder, and the one in which you are instead delocalized or partially delocalized for, uh, for a weak disorder. A question on uh, the energy thresholds, the mobility edge is uh, a bit uh, more delicate. It, again, it depends uh, specifically on the energy. I agree, totally agree with you. And po possibly you don't have access to that, uh, to these experiments. Okay, so any other question? Yes, uh, last one. Hi, Thomas. So, so my name is Henan. Uh, so my question is a bit technical. Uh, you showed in one of the slides a relation between the correlation length and the mean free path. And I, I wonder what is the definition of this mean free path? Do you define it from the, uh, the diffusion constant? And is this- Oh, yeah. Uh, is this relation valid uh, for all dimensions or- is there a range of validity between the relation of the mean free path and the, uh, the localization length? Right. So I think I took this expression from the original paper, but uh, I think that they commented that that expression is actually valid in the case of uh, weak disorder. So that's the regime where it holds. But I can, I can point you to the original paper uh, if you want to have uh, further details. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, thank you, Tommaso, once again. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good conclusion Bye. of the uh, workshop. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So now people coffee break time. Everybody's going to be happy.
happy to have a good presentation by Lauro Tomio. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the talk will be on dynamical vortex production with periodic time dependent perturbation applied to dipolar and non dipolar EC mixtures. Okay, we're looking forward to the talk. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and also to present the talk. So that is the title of the talk. It's a dynamical vortex production with periodic time dependent perturbation applied to dipolar and non dipolar back mixtures. I'm from Institute Physica Teorica. And uh, after a long time, this is my first time I think, talking the old Institute Physica Teoria in Pamplona. <laughs> because now we are in UNES in Barra Funda, as you know. No? So that's the. Uh... So these are some collaborators in this work that I've done uh, now. Uh, Sabari is a new postdoc that we have, no? and I say is a student that made a lot of uh, calculations also here. And Kishore now is a uh, is in New Zealand, and also we have Ashton Bradley in the first part that uh, we have some collaborators. I also have uh, some collaborators here in USP also, but in a different subject. We, have, we are talking about, about bubble uh, geometry that we are doing something with Arnaldo and his students also. So the aim of this talk is to report some recent computational studies that we have done on the dynamical production of a uh, stable vortex and, uh, and quantum turbulence by considering both dynes to condensate, confining pancake like traps perturbed by time dependent periodic uh, interaction. In this regard, uh, we have recently investigated uh, two kinds of uh, back system. Uh, the first look, is uh, we have considered vortex and turbulence generated by a steering time dependent uh, interaction in a two species coupled mass imbalanced condensate. For the perturbation, we have considered a slightly modified elliptically uh, periodic potential. The approach is applied to the experimentally accessible uh, binary mixture, rubidium cesium and rubidium rubidium, uh, which allow us to verify effects, possible effects that we have of mass uh, difference in the dynamics. This is what uh, recently appearing in physical review way. Okay. Next, I will report a more recent study. We are preparing for publication related to a single species dipolar system under periodic uh, linear and circularly moving uh, Gaussian-like obstacle, which is added to the trap as a perturbation. In this case, we have investigated the critical velocity of the Gaussian obstacle for nucleation of vortex dipole and cluster. So that's the outline of my talk. And first I talk about the steering binary back and some formalism and give the dynamics of steered vortex formation, kinetic energy spectrum and rotate frame field. And after I show some results and my conclusion on this topic. And because it creates quantum turbulence and also vortex generation at the end. Next, I shift to a dipolar system and the periodic moving obstacle. Uh, the formal is for a dipolar back again, a Gaussian perturbation, dipole dipole interaction, and the result. And I my conclusion on this topic. Okay, so quantum turbulence, many people here already have talked about, but I'm just repeating some here. The name given by the turbulence flow of a fluid at high flow rates of quantum fluid, such as uh, superfluid. Also, this is already well done, shown also in Wikipedia, with a lot of uh, reference on that. Now. So first was suggested by Richard Feynman, was the connection of turbulence with superfluid uh, via the quantized vortex line. The dynamics of quantum fluids are governed by quantum mechanics rather than classical physics. Some examples of quantum fluid include superfluid helium-4, or Cooper pairs of helium-3, and both sides condensate, polariton condensate. So it is being noticed also that quantum fluid exists at temperatures below the critical temperature at which uh, both sides condensate can take place. So quantum turbulence is an apparently random tangle vortex line inside a quantum fluid as indicated by the experiment and numerical uh, simulation. 
And the two main questions in this study is are vortex tangles really random or do they contain some characteristics, properties, or organized structure? And how far one can compare quantum turbulence compared with the classical turbulence? Okay, here we can show some picture about classical and quantum turbulence, the comparison here. Classical turbulence can be seen in classical fluid in many kind of ways that you know, by chaotic motion with their flow. Turbulence in the deep vortex from an airplane, for example, and ocean and atmospheric mixed layer. And, uh, and quantum turbulence, the other side, is characterized by the tangle of quantum vortex defect in quantum fluid. The quantum turbulence has been studying this system here and atomic bosons condensation. Here is a picture about super great red spot, and here is two large part of potential here as superfluid. And here are the one of the first experiments on that né, by the group here of the Bagnato, but published it, uh, in 2009 about the density profile in quantum turbulence observed by time of flight expansion and the distribution of quantized vortices inferred from uh, here, here uh, where the vortices are the, depicted by the black region. So here is one example also that we have studied some time ago, né? it's about turbulence occurred due to Riley Taylor instability né? that uh, uh, mixed system. Né? In that case, uh, uh, is that two, two systems, coupled system, but uh, with a non-miscible situation, immiscibility. Now let's go to the formalism of the first part. Is the first we have to go to the coupled uh, gross pit I have seen. Opa, I lost uh, the pointer here. Gross pit I equation is cast in a dimensionless format with the energy and the length units given respectively by this unit here. And here's the length. We are assuming the first space, the less massive one, as our reference in our unit system, such that uh, this is the frequency that is uh, in our unit. Within this unit, for simplicity, we first adjust the confined trap frequency of both species, such that the dimensionless non-perturbed three-dimensional traps for both Space can be represented by the same expression given in this way. Okay? Where the zero is the two dimensional harmonic trap, this way there is no explicit mass dependence factor in the trap potential, which will be remain only in the kinetic energy term. And here is the, our gross uh, pit IFC equation. Yeah. Here is the mass uh, ratio here, that is two dimensional moment operator. And G are the two body contact interaction related to the inter space and inter space scattering length, respectively, given by these two quantities here. So it's given hot in this way, uh, this term GIJ in terms of the scattering length here. And this is the mass, reduced mass of the system. So the laser steering is represented by laboratory frame time-dependent elliptical trap perturbation in both X and Y direction, given by this format. We have a, a small quantity here that perturbs the trap with epsilon and times this in, uh, with some uh, frequency here of the steering laser and with epsilon also the strength. That's follow also some uh, old paper also by Parker and Adams in 2005, about the emergence and decay of turbulence in the steer atomic back system. It's, they, are, they have done all for single system at that time. So with polar coordinates, I can uh, write in a more um, uh, easy way also to see the, uh, the steering potential that, uh, that we have a potential R and theta here. And this is just the trap. And this is the perturbation that I have. So the very small values of this here, 0 0.025 that we are using, is just to maintain the condensate with an approximate symmetric shape. So it's a very slight uh, perturbation that we keep for the long time evolution. And the lazy steel is more helpful to rotate backs 
with the uh, values greater than the entire frequency. In our simulation, we have used this frequency here now for this omega here. One close to one, but a bit too far. So, so in general, quantum gas are compressible fluids such that the corresponding density can change when submitted to a force. Uh, this is true to a certain degree as part of the fluid uh, can behave as an incompressible fluid, similar as a liquid. In our present case, the condensate submitted to a time-dependent steering potential associated to a torque, which is mainly due to a part of the rotational kinetic energy that we can call as the compressible part. So for each component of the mixture, we have this total energy given by this expression. That's amazing. Well, uh, this N here is the density, and the time dependent density that we uh, pointed out here. This N, I, N, and J for the two, uh, two systems that are coupled. That is the energy that we have. With the current densities in terms of the respective densities and velocity fields, uh, we, we can write these uh, velocities in this format here and the associated kinetic energy given by that form here, where K stands for the kinetic energy. So these I can decompose now in compressible part and incompressible one. For the decomposition, the density weighted velocity field is given by that form here. The density and velocity here can be split in incompressible part satisfying the divergent equals zero. And the compressible one, where is the rotational of U i compressible here is equal to zero. So therefore, um, uh, with U given by this non-compressed plus the compressed one, the corresponding kinetic energies can decouple in, those, in two terms here. Now, that they can separate in the non-compressible and compressible parts. So in two-dimensional space, with this K, uh, the X and KF, I have this form here, and I can transform that energy, the time-dependent energy, in this format using, uh, in this case, the Fourier transformer. So both compressed and decompressible parts are used to verify the, the result, the sound waves and vorticity uh, produced by the dynamics. So the torque experienced by the time dependent steering potential uh, can be obtained through the op this operator here. This is the torque that I put out in the polar coordinates given by the simple expression here. So corresponding to a rotation in the elliptical time dependent part of the potential uh, with uh, this transformation here. Okay. So it follows the expected values of the induced angular momentum in time dependence and the respective moment of inertia. So in that case, I have LD given this format here. And I can, in that way, associate with some classical rotation velocity, uh, time dependent in this format here. So the rotating frame velocity field at a given frequency omega, given by that here, and the associated particle current satisfy the continuity equation. So the time dependence of the densities in I here and the the current here. So when considering a rotating frame at a given frequency omega, I can uh, rewrite that energy in this format here again, using this uh, Fourier transformer. And in this term, I have also corresponded the momentum space energy, which defines the velocity power spectrum density in K space. Okay, so for computation of this power spectral here, uh, there is a Bradley and, and group also, we have developed some codes also that calculate this inside of. And here are some results that I have on this part here. 
first, for example, because you can see also the long time that you take for rubidium and cesium mixture. So we start with simulation here, and here's about T equal 200, and it goes for very long time evolution to 27,000 in this case of mass imbalanced uh, system, where the, the, this is much larger than this. Eh? This is for the first component. The first component every time is the lighter one, and the heavier one is this one here. And you can see here that uh, it goes through some region here first, and where it starts to have some turbulence in this part here, with some formation of vorticity around the, in the border. So, and after a long time, they crystallize in some kind of format uh, of vortices inside here, in this format here, where they can see clearly and be stable and rest for a long time in this way. Okay. Here, it, to reach this uh, way here, we take this time here at 27,000. Yeah, in the all units of time. And A2, also you can see more words do also the size of this because we have a larger mass for the cesium. But again, also we have a crystallization here after passing for this uh, an evolution of this mix. So the upper frame is for the rubidium, as I explained to you, component one, and the lower for component two is cesium. And these are the scattering length that we are using. And as you see, it has a miscible configuration for this, you know, because I have the, this one is smaller than this, the interspecies. So I have in a miscible configuration because it's much easier to see some effect of this, you know, the mixture. And here are the uh, corresponding energy that I show here, the binary rubidium and cesium mixture. And here you can see the kinetic, the total kinetic energy. And here is the separation of the compressible and uncompressible one. And here are the, the two kinds. The, the second here, the ma massive one, is this line here. And the other is this one here, okay, for the lighter one. And here you can see the, the compressible with the non-compressible. As we can see here, the non-compressible is this with the a triangle. It's going in more stabilization than the other one that's going increasing the sound wave, uh, it's all, all uh, way increasing. And the other one, there is some bend and go to some stabilization. So the time of Russia presented in lab frame um, for the total kinetic energy and corresponding compressor being compressed, indicating that way. So the evolution is shown in still stable vortex patterns are, uh, we can verify. And this we can verify also the other quantities that we have, like the torque for the rubidium cesium. Here you can see also the red one is for the uh, rubidium, or oh, sorry, for the cesium, the red one, and the other for uh, rubidium, the light one. Okay. And here is the time evolution that we have. There are some stabilization here. The heavy one, I think it goes a bit up here and, and stay there. But so the stable waters. Are very fast. And here, what, uh, what we have here is the angular momentum obtained, as I showed before in the expression that we call a classical rotation velocity you know, for the rubidium and cesium. That you can see also, this is some average quantity, but what we have here is the second component, the heavy one, and this is the uh, light one. As you see, they are stabilized in some kind of plateau. plateau you know after some time, after a long time here. So in that case, you can separate more clearly also this region where, the, where the, uh, this vertical line, more or less, you know, are approximately separate the three time uh, intervals of the evolution. First, we have a shape deformation, this part here. Second is a turbulent regime that we can call turbulent and we can verify really if they agree with some kind of classical turbulence with vortex nucleation at the end, no? the stabilizer in the, the region three. So that is, uh, this line here is another region of these two. Because why we are doing that? Because we want also to compare with a, a direct rotation of the trap, for example, what happened. Here, for example, I have shown before some results that I have with this steering potential, these are with this steering after a long time. 
So that I have the crystallization of A1 and A2 in vortex here now, okay? And in, in the other case, if I replace this steering potential, make this transformation here in my original equation, I remove the steering potential and I replace just for a rotation of the trap here, uh, angular momentum directly. So just to compare more or less the, if what I showed before here, it's, uh, there is some correspondence. For example, here is between 0 0.6 and 0 0.8 that stabilizing this uh, rotation. Yeah. And here you can see that more or less at this point here, I uh, uh, rotate in direct, direct the trap. I have this value corresponding to this steering, steering mechanism. So that, uh, but of course, there is a time dependent. So you have to take some average loss for some interval of the time. Okay. But here, for example, you have a, a time dependent then. So some average, some scheme uh, have to be found, take some average of this, some interval of time that we take from the uh, almost beginning then, like that. Here is a, is the set of log scale plots for the incompressible kinetic energy spectra for different time intervals here versus the, this is the healing length that is different from one part and the other part to do to the mass. You know? Okay, so why these lines here are sometimes that correspond to slightly different position. Here's the wave number and K is the healing length. The spectrum is calculated rotating frame with the upper panel for the first component and the bottom panels for the seven, second component. So I have here the large interval here and the other interval here, I think is already losing some uh, of the behavior that we had before here. For example, here, this line here represents the, the behavior K to the minus three or K to the minus five divided by three. That's the Kolmogorov law that we are expecting to see at least in some interval. No? And this you can see from here. Is the line here? Here, hot. maybe within this interval that we can see some. For that, also uh, we introduce some uh, some average kinetic energy spec from turbulent regime to incompressed kinetic energy spec. This for the rubidium set obtained by average of a fifty samples in the turbulent time interval that I showed before. Confirming the goal model of that uh, k to minus five divided by three be power law behavior. This one here. No? Opa. I think I down quite a bit here. Okay. Here. Okay. Here after it moves to another power k to the minus three. In this interval here. After uh, k uh, time healing length. We call around one here. Okay. So here is the I have the second case, rubidium eighty five and rubidium eighty seven. So the uh, these mixtures they have a mass imbalance very slight. You know? So it's almost the same mass for many effects. You know? Okay. So I can get like some similar picture for 200, 2,600, and 35,000. And here you can see also the, tur the turbulent uh, region that starts appear here and vortices come inside of the condensate here and after crystallizing. So the time evolution of the density, so the, well, the first component is the upper one, and the component two is the lower one. The parameters are the same as I used before to the other set. Okay. So all the parameters are the same. One thing that we can notice already from this year, and that one I can get some uh, crystallization already established in the last time, uh, 27, something like that. I have already some, uh, some patterns of performance. And here I have to go a bit far. One, uh, that's the, that's also the same that I showed before, but now for this uh, rubidum and rubidum mixed. 
So I still uh, waiting here just to see the behavior. This more or less only this small interval here. And this for this uh, time again, this is for 4,000. And after it lose this kind of behavior more. You know? So this pack is calculating the okay, with the upper pants, we want to for the first and the other for the second component. Again, I take some average and kinetic energy spectrum of this turbulent region. See being compressed by kinetic energy spectrum for the rubid and rubid mix by averaging over 50 samples in the turbulent region here. So this uh, is the behavior that I can say that more closely. And you can see that are very similar because the two systems have almost the same mass. Okay. So in conclusion of this part, I have a vortex part that produces dynamics by time dependent elliptical laser steering together with associated turbulent flow behaviors are studied and analyzed by considering two kinds of mass imbalance to cover both sides condensate with an effective two dimensional pancake like geometry. So the three different mass imbalance cup systems like this are considered, which are easily accessible and controllable, I think, in, in natural cold out experiments. So different regimes that occur in the time evolution due to laser steam are analyzed using the kinetic energy spectrum. So the first stage is the shape deformation introduced by the steering potential. This is followed by a symmetric breaking turbulent regime in which vortex nucleation starts to be generated at the surface of the two species, which agrees almost uh, with this law of Kolmogorov in some interval of momentum there. A final regime in the time evolution is verified by the production of a stable vortex pattern associated with the uh, summit rotational frequency of the steering potential. As a perspective, the presentation for coupled condensate under steering potential can be extended by using dumped gross uh analysis, because there is no dump in our uh, formalism here, no? with the treatment of the condensate with their corresponding thermal component. It can be useful to calculate precisely, for example, the effective rotational velocity of the thermal cloud. So for more details on this work, I think I have this uh, work that recently appeared here no? uh, with an assessment, a student that I have here, Kumar and Bradley from New Zealand. No? About what is generation? What is here is just what I just mentioned before. But what we have done that we try to reach this, that we have show that this kind of Kolmogorov behavior we can check in this this region. Here. That we go to the case from a case of the minus three. Okay, now I, I move to the other uh, part, my seminar. Here. Uh, about the dipolar system under periodic moving obstacle. This uh, is a quite different, the time dependent uh, potential that I'm using in this case. So we are investigating dynamics associated with moving Gaussian obstacle. In pancake like trap, the dipolar back. So it's a single condensate, uh, dipolar condensate. And I followed leading to quantum turbulence and vortex production. So by solving a non local to the gross type formalism in real time, the critical velocities for the nucleation of vortex dipoles and vortex clusters are obtained with respect to the dipolar interaction strength. So that's the usual formalism with this dipolar dipole interaction. That is our trap here and the 3D, uh, uh, the nonlinear part here in three dimensions, this is the equation here where I normalize in this way. N is the number of atoms and AS is the S-wave scattering length and this is the strength of the two body contact interaction with UDD being the dipolar interaction. So the trap will be assumed with a pancake-like cylindrical symmetric harmonic shape as usual perturbed now by a Gaussian shaped time dependent interaction. In this way, so I have the harmonic oscillator here and after I have the trap, the Gaussian format, where the, this is the use of the three dimensions is one that where I use this lambda much larger than one to simplify also the formalism and we can come to a kind of pancake-like again formalism. Okay? 
foi legal, sendo que os dias periódicos saem independente do obstáculo, as aperto de 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 tráfego, it's written this way, where this is the width and the amplitude here, and that is uh, the, the time dependent rotation here. The obstacle is moving a circle with the radius epsilon and frequency nu here, you know, that you can call also velocity of the. So in polar coordinates, again, also I can write in a simplified way, also in that format here. You know. That is the radius of this, and this is the usual radius of the two dimension. And as you can see, also you have this angle here changing in time. You know. So that's the point between the atoms A1 and A2. In general, AJ, you can say that. And with their line vector, make an angle theta related to, to the Z axis. And that we can take of theta around 90 degrees, right? For a strong pancake shaped trap. Both the dipole polarize in the same direction, make an angle alpha, we call tilted in an angle here with respect to the Z-axis. You know? There are also things right in long space there. Yeah. So the tunability is performed by time-dependent magnetic field with dipoles rapidly rotating around the Z-axis. The magnetic field is given by the combination of a static part along the Z-direction and the fast rotating part in the XY plane. Where with frequency such that the atoms are not significantly moving during each period. You know? Once performed a time average of the dipole dipole interaction within a period, the 3D average interaction between the coupled dipole atoms with magnetic dipoles are given in terms of the Bohr magnetum here can be read so in this format here. That's in the general here, but after you see with just one angle, you just taken that equal 90 degrees. So with the frequency and the length units given in these usual units, units of the trap. And I have this written just dimensionless format, and the three-dimensional equation is given in this format here, here. But the poly interaction is this one here. And this is the cubic term. This is the units that is here. And how, as I take a lambda very large, né? so I can separate the movement of the Z part né? from the other part here né? and integrate this in Z. Né? So the 2D reduction of the dipole dipole interaction configuration space is given by the Z integration. Form. In this format here, followed by a Fourier transformer to the moment space of the dipole dipole interaction and density. So both are uh, taking the put the transform. The configuration space uh, integral is related to the corresponding inverse Fourier transform. This is in detail in this paper here. So that's the corresponding uh, passage from the inverse of Fourier transform for the this quantity that was previously obtained and uh, the Fourier usual Fourier. So here, the, in the 2D moment space, the dipole, dipole can be expressed as the combination of two terms, considering the orientation of the dipoles, alpha and projects of the Fourier transform in moment space. One term is perpendicular with the other parallel to the direction of the dipole inclination. They are respectively given by this format here in terms of the air function here, no? the complementary air function. Yes. K is in this form by considering that all directions that are possible for a polarization field rotate in the, this plane. We can also average this by replacing this term to K to, uh, squared divided by two. And in that case, it comes in this format by combining the two terms. You know? I have the potential in that format. And the total 2D momentum space, the pole dipole interaction can be written in a, in a simple form, you know, combining both of them. With the dipolar term written in the Fourier space, the effective velocity types two dimension shift the dipolar back is given in this format here. And this is the term that I was calculated using the Fourier term. So, this is the two dimension uh, wave function normalized to one also, and the GS is this in terms of the scattering length here. Now, through a numerical simulation, 
solution of this equation, we investigate the vortex nucleation. For that case, we use the algorithm Crank Nichols method with fast Fourier transform. Really, I have to say also that most of this calculation is being done now by somebody, you know, one of the doctors we have done, you know, is doing most today. Is that part of the calculation? And these are the kind of, I, this is take just to represent where is the potential, not the real <laughs> picture that, but just the kind of thing that we are playing around. The main, main uh, system that we have uh, make is this one and this one here. So rotating this format here, the impurity that we have, the Gaussian potential, or this one. This one we have played a bit of, uh, but it's not giving too much difference of what the main ones are is this circular and this one here. You have said this uh, type of motion of the Gaussian obstacle. So I'm going to show the case of one and uh, three in which the amplitude of the obstacle is kept fixed. Because in this case here, the amplitude is not fixed. Uh, there's some periods that they can put here, but these two are kept fixed. In case of two and four, we have verified the effect of small vibration in the amplitude. So this uh, is our uh, phase diagrams of the critical velocity. So you see this part here by moving, uh, this V represents the velocity. And this alpha is the tilt uh, angle that can decrease or increase the dipole interaction. Remember that in the way that is written there, this dipole interaction, when it's zero is the maximum. So it's maximum the effect of the dipolar interaction. And that's going to decrease till one point here where it changes the signal. Because at 40, uh, 54, I think is the magic angle where it changes the signal. But uh, I'm representing most of this part here. We have also results for the other part when it shrink because effectively this dipole interaction is uh, acting together with the other the, uh, interaction that we have. No? So it's very, in fact, when I go to negative, it's just reducing that. In terms. So it's reducing also the size of this. So it's more difficult. So we have to, to be careful in taking the, uh, the radius of this perturbation, this Gaussian perturbation. So here is, uh, so I have for the case one and the case two, the, the results here. No? This is the case two where you see also the uh, region that we have vortex goes more to the right huh? And here I can have vortex in less uh, point here. And this is the case that we have a, a movement only in one direction. So yeah, when I have an angle that they call zero, I have only in X direction. So this is the regime for vortex emission. I start to have vortex emission here. And after at some point here, the emission of vortex is not coming anymore as a, as a pair, but it comes as a cluster. No? So that's more or less defined in this way. And that's the parameters that we have for the scattering length in terms of a ball radius and for dipole dipole interactions and the number of particles and also the, the potential, the A0, the strength no? of this, and the absolute 0.5. So this is crucial if I reduce it too much the size of the condensate. So I have to decrease also this epsilon. Here are some uh, results that I have for the case of circular movement, uh, type one, with the speed 0 0.8, this one here, and 1.5, uh, considering a short time interval here né, that I have. I, have. I have only to this part here. And can you show me the GIF also? Okay. It is more or less just a picture of a movement. What we have, if we have low speed and high speed, how it creates the, this vorticity. It comes as pair, but one comes before the other because of the geometry that we have. No? And here when we have a high speed, no, like a V1.5, no, and that's the time that we have here. Okay? Oh, so that's the activity. Okay, 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 thank you. And here is just a representative static in the, this uh, movement here. 
I can also show more pictures here. It's in a long time interval, but as you see here, if I have a low speed, I can keep for long time also this kind of uh, densities. No? With this, uh, of course, this point here is the point of my obstacle no? that I'm moving. And the others are the vortices that have been created here. And here, if I get here for a long time here, decreasing a lot of these densities. No? So, so it is better to see in that small interval for large velocity. No? It's collapsing there. And here is also a time evolution of the vortex nucleus for uh, type one, also the same a circular, no? uh, for three different uh, speeds, 0 0.3, 0 0.8, and 1.4. No? Alpha equals zero is when I have the maximum. Oh, sorry. Ah, yeah. When the maximum effect of the dipole interaction. So you see here the time is uh, given here. Zero start. Of course, when it's zero here, uh, it's before putting the, uh, uh, the impurity inside the, the Gaussian obstacle. And here is already with the Gaussian obstacle. And after how it creates this uh, words inside. Yeah. So here they say when I have a like here the uh, as shown also in some diagrams there, it start uh, having more than a pair every time creating here in this movement. No? Here is the case of linear obstacle when I have the same speed, for example, new point eight with alpha equal zero in the upper line and 1.5 in alpha equals zero degrees and 30 degrees in the other two cases here, zero and 30 degrees. So this means that uh, when I have 30 degrees, I'm reducing a bit also the effect of the dipole dipolar strength interaction by the cosine alpha that I have. So here I have the nucleus here, but one thing that you can see more clearly, so why I think that this case is much easier maybe to study I think, analytically in some way, because you can see the creation of pair every time symmetrically, just because the movement is in just one direction. And here also you can see also how it comes symmetrically. So that I have, uh, I reached all my conclusion. I have some other things to also to show about the energy and so on. But I think that the uh, correspond is the same as the previous case that I showed. Yeah. Yeah. So when as you follow, see under periodic moving obstacle, we report some preliminary results on this dynamics of what in a dipole back by solving numerically the 2D uh, non-local gross type equation with the trap perturbed by a moving periodically obstacle. So the critical velocities for the formation of vortex pair, as well as to produce clusters of vortices, are shown that increase by increasing the strength of dipole interaction. When I say increasing the strength, again, I'm just uh, remembering that I increase the strength, diminishing the angle alpha. Oh, wow. Be careful. <laughs> uh, Okay, so for the formation of as well as to produce cluster, are shown that increase by increasing the strength of the polar interaction. So for the thing in dynamics of what and radiation, of course, during the dynamics of what with opposite rotation. Okay, those are some related references that I have here. One is uh, that published recently, also by Bradley, about the numerical methods also that he has used for the spectral analysis. There. And this is uh, one paper that gives this motivation was to study for the coupled system by Parker and Adam. And that there are some other papers here also that people also from here also that have some things to report to study more this turbulent in traffic atomic bosine condensation. So in that case, I have just finished my presentation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Lauro, for this very nice presentation. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, so, yes, mm. Nick. All oh, right. <laughs> Hi, thank you for this very nice talk. Uh, uh, I'm just a bit confused about something, but maybe it's my mistake. Um, so when you have a condensate and you induce these shape oscillations, you know, you're trying to crystallize into a vortex lattice, 
you call this initial regime turbulent when you're exciting these surface modes, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's typically one vortex, one by one, that comes in yeah. from the lattice. I naively would not have thought of this regime being turbulent. I thought that turbulent is a slightly different regime, mm -hmm. unless it is in the sense of somehow uh, sort of wave turbulence, but then I don't know how wave turbulence leads to this formation of the vortices. So could you explain a bit this process and why you call the early regime turbulent? Yeah, this is just really not a, a theoretist that came most from this turbulent area. So I just trying to follow also the way that they try to analyze this regime at some interval. Because also Bradley was saying that maybe is a, the time is too short there to conclude that really a Kolmogorov behavior that né? that's really a, is something that I, I really have to learn a bit more about that now. So really, because you are saying that, for example, the, why we are calling your red turbulent now. So I'm just following if in something something a study that was we are trying just to see the spectrum in this interval where is not crystallized any uh, vortices still. So there is only some noise there that you can see we are trying to separate. And also uh, we have to remember that we have also the sound waves and also these other together and this kind of thing. Well, of course, no, it, it is quite a dynamically moving yeah. system. Yeah. Uh, but I'm I'm just unaware. I mean have other people claimed this to be a turbulent regime early on, or is this the first claim of, of such? No, I think it's not the first claim. I think there is also the, uh, you can see also the people by, uh, not by the, the by and Adams, you mean. By, uh, Blood Egg also there um, okay. uh, recently, where they claim, but it's for a single condensate there. Now, yeah, but the, so the, this early yeah. regime, they still call turbulent before the... Well, so, uh, but, um, Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the yeah. uh, Concerning to the bosch bos uh, mixture, when you have these vortices, uh, I am wondering if you can see that one species go into the core of the second species. <clears throat> so, in other words, if you see what is called massive vortices, because it's expected that in some cases in the bosch bos mixtures, when you rotate one species, the other species go in the core of this, mm -hmm. and then the vortices become massive, and somehow the dynamics could change. Could you comment on that, or have you seen no, this? I, I really, I, this is something that will be thing because you say that are combining with that, uh, because you have uh, two species there, né? and how to have uh, uh, that uh, really are in the same trap, né? some way. That's uh, and that uh, really is some question that but I it, think it, normally so imagine that you put a small fraction of a second species yeah so it was made for instance in helium with hydrogen this is impurities go normally in the in the core of the because these impurities do not participate of the angular momentum mm -hmm. of the of the rest of so they tend, tend to go to the core because the core is less dense when they try to go there and it's one of the ways in which you can follow a, a vortex for instance in helium is the only way because you have a vortex you cannot see the vortex unless you put some impurities in the, the more popular cases when you put hydrogen and the hydrogen go uh -huh. on the core and then you can visualize the hydrogen and you see the vortex tangle and the, okay. just wondering if you can uh, because mm, i think I that have, uh, uh, if okay. the if the vortex has a mass or not in the sense that you feel the core or not, could affect the dynamics in general. Yeah, that's an observation. Yes, thank you, thank you. But really, uh, this is something that we still analyze, and that also any kind of question like this, I think can be important for in our analysis to check né, better, né? Yes, because not uh, just some preliminary also that we have studied. And really, this, uh, because you see that this second case that I've shown here, it comes more dynamically with the production with just some kind of. Uh, and, yep. uh, okay, thank you. I have actually a follow up question quickly before. Um, so, on your slide 24, where you were showing these um, patterns mm -hmm. of vortices in the two different species, I mean, it, it was quite striking that it seems that the vortex. Yeah, or 28, 24, exactly. Okay. So my question is simply, are the vortices of the rubidium sitting at the maxima of the 
um, distribution in the cesium. So it's basically, is there a correlation or an anti-correlation between the two images on the right? The two images? Mm. No, uh, because I mean, in numerically- it's a, it's, a we, it's a mixture, right? Yeah. Yeah, but uh, there is some correlation because you can see, but only that is the lower uh, that you can see below. Né? But more or less, when you have that hole in some place there né, where the vortices, the other is in, should be in another position. In, in principle, this. But that only means the, there is some correlation yeah, between yeah, these two is. patterns. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, can you also inject less vortices such that you give more space to the, to the other? Somehow I, now uh, it uh, seems that, uh, like you yes, only I allow. Understand. But no, this, I think, is like quite a difficult because you have to restart I think, the program again because it takes a long time also for this reason. So, and also to get some kind of vorticity here, now, uh, look that first we have to explore the kind of uh, frequency that we can use now, to create this kind of uh, turbulent, uh, I think, <laughs> that uh, uh, dynamics that end up this. And uh, it was tried also before by Kishun to have uh, some smaller frequency uh, to see, uh, just to reduce. But it stay before 0.9, we cannot get any kind of vortices at the end. And one additional question Do they, well, can you say something about the vorticity? So are they all rotating clockwise or counterclockwise? So I'm wondering if no, this they like cannot some, stay. Uh, like uh, yeah. that, that yeah, because, uh, because this comes from uh, some dynamics that we can see only the vortices there uh, uh, crystallize in some position after a long time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Only, uh, only that they are not moving these vortices. They, are kind of, they end up. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We have one more question. So hi, uh, you showed some results for binary mixer, uh, qu quantum turbulence. So if we consider a system where the spin dynamics terms also in the system, what? Uh, spin mixer terms, spinal condensate, let's say. Mm -hmm. So uh, then also can we expect this uh, called growth power law, I mean, KS over minus five by three, or it would uh, it not be there? I don't know like because you are see just uh, taking some other effect to see this Kolmogorov, but um, uh, I'm, I just not, I'm not clear it's, uh, it's going to be. Uh, 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 okay, so, and other thing is like what, I mean, what are the like uh, application of this uh, quantum turbulence in like experiments if, if we study that? Mm -hmm. uh, this is what we are expecting because we are doing some kind of simulation that we expect that in, uh, experimentally one could see something similar at least. Né? Because note that in this case here, we are uh, just disturbing uh, spherically symmetric, but just slightly. Né? So, so why it takes a long time because you don't, if we start shaking too much here, we uh, become difficult to uh, any kind of analysis. Né? So. But so in this way, what we are saying that uh, maybe one should try also to go very slowly this, this deformation elliptically and to see if this kind of effect can be seen. Yes. Okay, thank yes. you. Okay, are there any further questions? Mm -hmm. There is one. It's more uh, a suggestion than a question. <laughs> Because uh, at some point we have discussed also these um, quantum fluctuation corrections to the gross Pdfsky equation. Okay. They are not necessary mm -hmm. here to describe something, but they come the reality a the little reality closer. Are there. <laughs> and as we know from nonlinear dynamics, uh -huh. uh, tiny changes can have in the long time some effect. So I'm wondering in, in uh, the context of of uh, quantum turbulence in general and, and maybe these particular uh, mm -hmm. scenarios you have investigated how robust they would yeah, that would be, be very interesting. Uh, uh, in connection to including uh, those mm -hmm. uh, quantum fluctuation terms, which are known for mm -hmm. the Bose Bose mixtures as well as for, for, for the Daimler mm -hmm. terms, right? Yeah, sure. I understand, sure. That would be very interesting to introduce already quantum fluctuation and just try to study this because it's just a small perturbation that we have. That will you try also this is by a uh, potential there in this, but we could have already there in the nature that we have also this kind. Okay. Okay, do we have any further questions? Um, 
I might have one actually uh, looking at this slide. So you choose to have rubidium and cesium, and then you write uh, that you have very comparable scattering lengths, actually 60 and 30 A yeah. naught. Do you have any um, comment on what would happen if I have a species, a species where I have, for example, a Feshbach resonance, and I can make the vortices extremely tiny with strong interactions, mm -hmm. uh, controlling the healing length. Uh, really, uh, the idea to use this is only to have a mixable configuration, uh, only that, but we could choose another uh, value, of course. Uh, but oh, I, and that would change your, uh, have you, no, so this, you have just uh, done these simulations for these parameters? No, but we have not done for a long time, I think, at least I don't remember if I was, uh, did also, it varies more these terms here. Né? But I guess I think we are getting the same kind of thing, maybe more time or less time that we can have this kind of uh, uh, final picture, no? but um, that I'm not sure, because this, at least if I take this smaller than this, much smaller, it, it happens that uh, we have separated more the system, so we cannot see this, uh, this effect. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so if there are no further questions, uh, first of all, let's thank all the speakers from this session this morning. Thank you very much. And uh, since we're already giving a round of applause, I think we should also thank the organizers of this workshop for this excellent okay, thank you. Uh, conference. Yeah, Axel and Arnaldo, thank you very much. Um, and I just hand over the microphone now to someone. Oh, the homepage. In a little bit reduced. But I was told that, for instance, the van which brings our Sakalos people uh, back to their home, that they have installed some some video screens, and and they have been following Laurio's talk, and and also are following um, the concluding remarks. So uh, greetings to the Sakalos shuttle here uh, from here from the lecture hall. So we have had uh, eighteen uh, invited speakers. Uh, 19 posters, and then of the order of uh, seven, eight uh, uh, other participants. And among the students, uh, there were five, six very courageous students in so far, because they attended also uh, prior uh, to the workshop, a two weeks uh, school on ultra cold quantum gases. So they are now very well trained after having three weeks of uh, talks and discussions and experiences. Now, um, I think it's uh, also time uh, to thank uh, all uh, everybody who was involved in this uh, business here. And uh, the first thanks I think should go uh, to the late uh, Mahir Hussein because he envisioned many years back, so to speak, uh, today's event and, and he managed to get uh, the financial support from, from the respective uh, agencies. And uh, it was both Arnaldo's and, and, and my uh, intention to, to try uh, to follow, so to speak, his spirit in, in this kind of, of conferences. And I think having a crowd of people of about 45, which is not too large, so that it is not possible to talk to everybody and not too small, so um that there would be no uh, uh, further discussions right i think we had a, a, a quite a, a, a number of participants just in between uh, these boundaries now the funding agencies uh, are also seen here right so um we had uh, uh, funding uh, from uh, the sao paulo estate uh, by farpesp then uh, from the ictp which has a south american uh, dependance, uh, which is called SAFIR. Then there's UNESP, uh, which is um, 
um, a university, if I understood it correctly, funded from Sao Paulo state. Uh, and then IFT uh, is presumably the Institute for Theoretical Physics belonging uh, to that university. And then most uh, prominently also the Instituto Principia because they uh, gave us the possibility uh, to have this meeting here in this quite nice uh, lecture hall. Then uh, I should thank also Arnaldo, who is hiding here for a certain purpose at the side. <laughs> um, so because, uh, you know, the funding was there, he was a perfect uh, local organizer. So from my side, as a foreign organizer, there was quite not too much to do uh, apart from enjoying the whole event. So I think uh, he uh, brought the spirit of Mahir uh, Hussein, uh, so to speak, uh, to this event. And uh, believe it or not, he helped with a great routine, as if he would have organized already a lot of conferences. So it was really a pleasure. But uh, I think we should also uh, thank the people uh, behind the scene, uh, whom uh, you have only partially uh, seen. Uh, and uh, we have here uh, Shandira uh, Oliveira and her assistant Natalia. Maybe you come down because uh, you know uh, they they produce this electronic booklet also with the help of Umberto Neto from Cypher. Uh, uh, so the, this was a lot of work, and then they had with everybody of you some more or less extensive email correspondence to serve all the particular individual needs of everybody. And uh, I think it was very pleasant to stay here because it was a workshop of the short ways, right? There's the hotel, there's the conference site, a lot of restaurants, vibrant Sao Paulo. So I think it was a, a, a great uh, uh, location here and you helped to make it possible. Thanks. And as you have may noticed uh, from time to time, there were some young people running around helping here technically, and uh, they even exchanged from day to day. So I was told that Wellington, Juan, Eduardo, Milena, and Luis uh, helped during the whole week. So I think we should then also give a hand of applause because that was quite essential at moments where we thought, oh, something is uh, happening here technically, but they uh, happened to solve all the problems. So finally, um, I, I think I had the impression that this field of, of low dimensional quantum gases seems to be a quite vibrant one, right? So we had a, a, a fair cross section of the field, I think, with atomic and photonic realizations, with all kinds of uh, uh, numerical and, and, and field theoretical methods uh, being applied. And uh, I'm looking now to Arnaldo. <laughs> so uh, maybe in the not too uh, far future, we uh, may think about of having a, a similar event, maybe uh, because uh, things are ongoing and, and it might be worthwhile uh, to meet in, in, in this circle again. And at the very end, uh, because it may be very long until this next event, I have some self-advertisement. Can you show the next slide, please? The, yes, exactly. So in uh, uh, at the beginning of August, uh, from the 6th to the 12th of August, uh, we will have a Batonne Physics School on ultra-cold uh, atoms and molecules. And if you please scroll down a little bit, at the homepage, yes. So uh, down so that we see all the names and topics. Yes, exactly. So we have already uh, seven uh, invited speakers who agreed to come. So you can see uh, the topics. So uh, there's about, uh, we have Nathan again, right? So uh, that's very great. Uh, and then uh, we have other topics, BAC, BCS, crossover, quantum gas, cavity, QD, Rydberg physics, and uh, topological pumping, Floquet engineering. So um, I should say uh, that if you attend, uh, there is um, some tiny 
uh, um, a school fee uh, and if you would be able to arrive with some uh, uh, by some means uh, uh, this event would be with, for free um, lodging and and accommodation and meals right so um, it might be nice uh, to see you then in August in Germany and with this I thank for your attention. I think yeah. we we can now enjoy a, a one meter snack. I was told. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> With, please note, not alcoholic drinks. <laughs> that was made very clear for, right from the beginning. <laughs> no, he is asking us to take a, a last picture here in oh. front of the stage, please. Good. Anyway, you must come from the downstairs, and we take a.